like to call the meeting to order. This is the regular meeting of the Ohio Planning Commission for August 2nd, 2017. Members of the public wishing to address the Planning Commission on items appearing on the agenda are requested to complete a speaker's card and file it with the secretary prior to the start of the meeting. Cards are available in the lobby. Speakers should state their name and address for the record and please limit your comments to three minutes or less. Comments must be directed to the commission, not to the audience. While planning commission is in session, all in attendance are expected to maintain order and decorum and to obey the orders of the chair. Could we have roll call, please? Chair Merck. Here. Vice Chair Quillacy is absent. Commissioner Zabella. Here. Corbin. Here. Nolan. Here. Powers. Here. And Jagiello is absent. Thank you. Commissioner Powers, could you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? Thank you. Um, the first item on our agenda is public communications, and before we get into that, I would like to just take a moment to um, recognize David Mason, who passed away last week. Um, he was a, uh, a stalwart of Ohio. He, he really epitomized everything that uh, we sort of strive for here on the Planning Commission, and we will greatly miss him. So I would like to uh, just have a moment of silence in uh, memory of David Mason. Thank you. Uh, public communications is the time set aside during the Planning Commission meeting for members of the public to address the Planning Commission on items of city business other than scheduled agenda items. Matters raised at this time may be briefly discussed by the Commission and will generally be referred to staff and are placed on a subsequent agenda. Under state law, other than for emergency items, no action can be taken at this meeting. So anybody who wants to speak on anything that's not on the agenda? Okay. Um, We'll move on to our disclosure of site visits and ex parte contacts. Um, can we start on my left with Commissioner Powers? I visited both sites. I had no ex parte contacts. I'll be recusing myself from item number one, and I did visit the um, second item. Thank you. Commissioner Corbin? I'm familiar with both sites and had no ex parte contacts. Sure I've also well. visited both sites and had no ex parte contacts. Thank you. I'm familiar with both sites, although I have to say, I've never visited the area of the Ohio Valley Inn where this uh, project is proposed, and I've had no ex parte contacts. Uh, we're going to move on to our public hearing items. Item one is a design review permit, DRP 1707. All right, now is the time. Excuse me. Um, I'm going to be recusing myself from this item. I'm the uh, sole licensed landscape architect in my firm, so I'm going to be sitting with the presenters um, during this item. Thank you. Thank you. We still have a quorum without uh, Commissioner Nolan, so we will proceed. Design review permit DRP 1707, tree permit T 1720 for the construction of new assembly event venue, parking lot, and removal of and work under protected trees at the Ojai Valley Inn and Spa, located at 905 Country Club Road. The general plan land use designation of the site is Institutional Recreational IR, and zoning classification is Institutional Recreational IR3. Categorical exemption has been prepared pursuant to the California Environment, Environmental Quality Act. The owner is the Ojai Valley Inn and Spa, and the applicant is Alex Kim, Managing Director. Could we hear from staff on this, please? Good evening, Commissioners. Um, I'm Catherine Leisure. I'm a contract planner with the City of Ojai. I haven't been around much, but I have been working with the City for over two years, so I just wanted to, not all of you have seen me before here, so <laughs> not new, just new to coming back to Planning Commission. Um, so tonight before you is the Ojai Valley Inn and Spa. What they're presenting to you is the construction of a new um, event venue called the, um, it's the barn. Um, currently right now, the Ojai Valley Inn and Spa has a venue that they use off-site that's actually within the county of Ventura. Um, the county has come to them and told them that they can no longer have this use there, even though it's been going on for 26 years. So in response to that, they are proposing to come forward and bring that venue essentially onto their own property. Um, 
So it is two large barn structures, um, outdoors, um, grass areas where they could have outdoor um, venue things take place, um, patio areas, kitchens, things like that. So essentially it would contain it all on site. Um, one thing to be aware of is currently all these events are taking place at the inn at this offsite. The way the inn has these events function is it's all guests at the inn that have these events. They come and they park at the inn now and then are, and then are shuttled to these sites. So essentially bringing this event venue onto their site will reduce those shuttle trips, but really have no other changes to traffic as it is because all those people are currently already coming to the Ojai Valley Inn and parking there and leaving their vehicles there and our guests at the inn. Um, it's three buildings, associated parking, a 10,000 square foot lawn area, additional landscaping and site work at the site. Um, it's going on an existing parking lot that is currently there between the 18th and 9th hole. So it's within an area that's already semi-developed with a parking lot. That parking lot, they're not losing that parking. They're moving that parking lot over to another area um, a few hundred feet away. So they will maintain the current parking they have on site for the end. So there'll be no removing of parking and not putting back. In fact, when they do come forward, they will build the parking lot first so they don't have any issues with missing parking. And then they will move forward with working on the barn. Um, the applicants are here. I know they have a big presentation video for you to go over everything to give you a more in-depth explanation of what the proposal entails. Thank you, Catherine. Do we have any questions for staff? I have a lot of questions for staff, but I don't okay. know if um, now it's time or if I should hear from the applicant, but um, this is a really huge project. It's 26,000 square feet of new structures, 10,000 square feet of lawn, 37,000 square feet of impervious parking and um, for me this report was really um, lacking in um, the data that I need to make the conclusions that are um, in the report um, so for instance the staff reports floating certain premises but I don't see the evidence for the following that the previous facility was only used for guests of the hotel that it had been not been used for non-hotel affiliated events, and that this proposed facility, facility will require no new employees. So we can't just say things and then have it be so. We, we need to see some documentation that, that there, especially since this is supposedly a use that's been going on for 26 years, um, I would have expected to see the county permits with conditions for the previous, <coughs> excuse me, previous facility, so we have a baseline for the traffic, with regard and with regard to the size of the facility, the number of guests, the documentation for how non-hotel guests are excluded, hours of operation, how it's limited to hotel affiliated events only. Um, so again, staff needs to provide us evidence and let us draw our own conclusions, not just tell us how it is and then say it's it's okay. Um, there's also several errors in the resolution referring to the motor court um, and there isn't one condition placed on this project that's other than really standard conditions there's nothing tying it back to the tree report um, there's nothing about how um, what the limitations are for non-hotel guests or non-hotel affiliated events these things should be conditioned if that is what it is based on so I, I have seen several projects come from the inn and I'm used to seeing a very you know persuasive and clear report and I'm just unfortunately not seeing that this time so um, here are my questions I'd like to see the county permit and everything that went with that so I can see what those original conditions of approval I'd like to see the 2002 um, environmental impact report showing um, the parking and the pervious pavement pavement issues um, I'd like to know what the max number of people on site who will be using these facilities, what's the employee count, what's the lawn area to be used for, um, will the facilities be leased or rented, what's the temporary storage for. These are all questions that we need to have answered so that we can make a reasoned conclusion. And um, the traffic report simply just says the same thing the staff report says, which is that all these things are true, therefore we can conclude that there's no additional impact and that's not what we do here so as much as I think there's great things about this project and it's 
you know, impressive and all of that, we need to have data in order to proceed. So that's my thinking today. Thank you. Bobby, did you have a question? No? Catherine, do you want to respond to any of that or should we just hear from the applicant? I, I mean, I just went off of what was submitted. We felt that that was adequate information. Um, I'm not going to be guaranteed, but I don't believe there were any permits with the county. Um, the inn could answer those questions in regards to the county issues and why they're no longer doing information there and things like that. So I think I will just kind of leave that to the applicant. Okay. So let's hear from the applicant. Hi, everyone. My name is Chris Kanzara. I'm uh, Vice President of Marketing at the Ojai Valley Inn and Spa. And um, I have my PowerPoint here, so I'll walk through everything. Um, so I don't miss any notes, but I'm happy to answer any of the questions because you have some relevant questions I'd like to kind of cover. Um, first of all, I'll give a brief overview of why the Ojai Valley Inn is building this facility. And um, really the purpose at its core is defensive to begin with. Um, and it also allows us to further distinguish our product among our competitive uh, hotels in Southern California and beyond. Um, the Ojai Valley Inn has leased the Rancho Dos Rios Ranch for 26 years. Um, if well, you're all locals here, you're probably familiar with that off of uh, Creek Road from Mary Bergen. It's an 800-acre uh, ranch where it has a very large, we call it the Big Red Barn, and then there's another barn that has all the kitchen equipment, and then there's a huge paddock for, um, for uh, dining, and then there's another entryway that also is used for dining. Um, so we were notified in early fall of last year, of 2016, that the conditional use permit um, to operate the ranch as we had been operating will not be renewed um, from, by Mary Bergen, who owns the property, uh, which means Ojai Valley Inn cannot host any more group events there. Um, and we came to an agreement with the county that we would be able to uh, use the facility through June of 2017 which is now passed, so we currently do not operate uh, the facility for group events. On average, annually, there are nearly 7,000 total group rooms that are tied to utilizing this event space as part of their programs. Um, it's a combination of corporate group events and weddings, and uh, the potential revenue loss uh, for our property is uh, approximately $6 million annually. So it's a significant loss in revenue for the hotel, and uh, as you can imagine, what is all attached to that. Uh, so we began uh, rapidly putting together a plan to reduce our risks uh, because um, we are not in the position where we can sustain a revenue loss of that size. So um, we, our proposed solution was um, really it solves the immediate risk of revenue loss. Um, it uh, allows us to not lose momentum of the success that the property has been doing with occupancy. And, um, and there's a couple other great uh, benefits to this project. Number one, it, it allows guests to walk right to the facility. Uh, currently, as Catherine had noted, um, there is, if anyone's been to the hotel on a weekend or even midweek, you will see a flurry of shuttle buses or um, larger buses, coaches, mini coaches from 24 people to car vans. I mean, they're all going um, in varying directions, um, either they're using, well, they always use Country Club Road, and then they use Creek Road, of course, uh, Hermosa, as well as Ojai Avenue, depending on the size of the vehicle. So I'm sure you've all noticed that living here in uh, the valley, that there's quite a bit of activity going in and out of that area. Um, also, the location within the property, we took a lot of time to study where exactly is the perfect ideal place for this barn to go. Uh, we looked at several different locations around the resort, but um, we had to keep going back to the test of, is it easy for guests to get to? Um, does it eliminate transportation? And noise for our neighbors. Uh, that was another important factor because there are events that sometimes will have music and we need to make sure that there's not an impact to some of the neighbors around the property. So we found that this location on the lower level of our campus, which is the parking lot that is near the spa, if any of you are familiar with that, and we're going to see an animation in a moment here so you'll be able to get a good bird's eye view for where exactly it's placed, is really the best place on the resort grounds for it. Um, and then lastly, it further positions our resort product as unique. Um, if you were to go on YouTube or, or Google Ojai Weddings, um, 9 out of 10, or you're going to see a barn event 
happening. Uh, barn events are very popular as a venue, and it's something that I think is very natural for an experience here in Ojai, and it's something that our competitive hotels that are mostly on the ocean don't necessarily have. So it's really true to the Ojai experience and feel. Um, so this facility that you're going to see in a minute, and I know you've reviewed previously, has really four primary aspects to it. Number one is the, bar the, the barn itself, which is 8,000 square feet of interior space. Um, the secondary barn is a smaller barn, and it really is a multi-purpose building that will be able to uh, host receptions, uh, bridal get-ready room, um, there's breakout space, and the building also flexes for many different uses. Uh, Epicurean leisure guest experience is what we like to call it when it's not in use for events. So wine tastings, cheese tastings, pasta making classes, things of that nature could take place in this smaller barn um, and be a resort guest experience for them that again is unique that you don't get at a lot of our competitive hotels. Third is the event lawn. Um, uh, is existing grass as it is now. Um, we're going to um, kind of uh, better define that space and that would be used for um, for you could put a tent on there. It could be used for lunches or dinners. Um, you know, we, we have a lot of tents that happen at the inn, and so there'd be a lot of use for that space in general. Um, and then lastly is culinary gardens. We're excited um, because as part of this plan, we have uh, gardens that are raised planter beds that are built within the, uh, the overall plant uh, that will grow seasonal vegetables and herbs and um, will be at the uh, literally feet away from the kitchen where the chef can actually uh, harvest the, the vegetables right there and be used as part of the meal. So that's an exciting aspect as well. Um, since we knew we needed a barn, um, we wanted uh, to select an architect that really specializes in this kind of um, architecture and build a, a barn that has a rustic feel yet is luxurious in its finishes. Uh, we really wanted the best, so we went out and did a lot of research and we found the firm Backham, Gillum & Kroger, who uh, the principal uh, or one of the partners is here uh, with us tonight. Um, their work is really extraordinary. Uh, some of the projects that they have successfully executed include Meadowood Resort in Napa, uh, very Napa-centric, um, Sundance, uh, Cordoval, Esperanza in, uh, in Mexico, Solage, Cast uh, Calistoga, and really countless Napa luxury wineries. Um, so they were really th the best and the perfect fit for this type of a project. Um, so what I'd like to do next is really just kind of walk you through the facility itself, if I could. If we could play the video. goes on both? Mm -hmm. Okay. So here's that lower turnabout <laughs> off to the right to the spa. So we're going to first go in and through um, the parking lot, which um, you're, the guest entry will be right down through the middle of two sides of parking. Um, as you enter into the property, um, you're going to come to a covered walkway. And then off to the left is the, uh, the barn itself and we're going to actually walk right through that and over into the smaller barn in a moment. So as we walk first through into the pre-function area or the staging area, perhaps conference registration or um, before the wedding doors open, people would gather in here and in the courtyard and then they would go into the barn itself. Um, and this is just mocked up with some tables in here, um, not necessarily like a dance floor or stage or for weddings or whatnot, but it gives you an idea of the, the general look and feel of the facility. We're going to go out through very large nano doors into this courtyard area in between the uh, large barn and the small barn, where it is flanked with a, uh, a fireplace. And we'll go through this little garden gate area where the first uh, aspect of this barn is uh, what we're calling the library. So a small gathering area, you can have wine events in here. And then you go into the actual larger space here, uh, which is where we would have the exhibition cooking and um, guests can learn classes and whatnot here. Off to the right, or the north I believe that is, um, you can see some of the uh, vegetable and herb beds that we have in integrated into the overall design and feel. And then turning around and going back the other direction, You'll see a large ranch style table, another fireplace, and then more vegetable and herb um, garden beds here on this side. 
And as you go through here, you'll see um, we may have a possible bocce ball court there as well for the events. Um, and then this takes you the other direction, so you're looking out towards the parking lot that will that is there now and will be replaced uh, with a new one. Turning around, going the other direction is the event lawn itself. Again, as mentioned by Catherine, 10,000 square feet. And now we go to a bird's eye view, and this will give you a really good idea of where exactly the location is. So you can see the spa uh, building in the back, um, and this will circle around all the way and give you a really good uh, sense for the facility itself. And then at the conclusion of this video, I can take any questions or further discuss anything that you had, um, any concerns. And I also have Sylvia and Aaron here from back in uh, uh, the, the architect firm that can speak as well. Great. So do we have questions for the applicant? What do you think the max number of people on site using the facilities would be? Um, depending on the style of their tables, whether they put eight at a round or 10 at a round, we're looking around 400, 450 people. Okay. Is that we both have, both barns together? Uh, no, this is the larger barn. The smaller barn could do, uh, there's, uh, there's eight rounds of eight, so 64 is what you saw in there, 64 seats, and then that library room has uh, depending on the length of the table, could have 12 people, I suppose, sitting mm -hmm. at it. And would you have events in both barns simultaneously? Um, it's possible. It's possible, but um, generally with weddings, they like to take over the whole facility. Um, so they'll probably have their reception in the small barn, um, and then they'll move over to the actual um, the dinner event and the dancing in the larger barn. So can I just finish my questions? Sure. Thanks. Um, so you could have up, upwards of 500 people there yes. at a time. Okay. Absolutely. Um, what's your employee count? Uh, about 740 people? employees total, 750. So that's not all full-time. Um, that's a combination mm -hmm. of on-call and part-time and then after all So say to work a max event, how many employees would you be? Uh, with a max there? event, you'd probably have, well, you'd, you'd have, um, depending on the style of service, because if it's buffet, it's less employees. If it's actually table serve, it's more employees. Um, so you're looking at, you could do, let's see, there'd be maybe 35 rounds, two tables each, 15 servers, back of the house. Um, there could be 50 employees probably working in the whole facility, including stewarding and whatnot. Okay. What, what's the lawn area for, and, and how are you gonna maintain that? That seems really thirsty. Oh, yes. Um, the lawn area, well, it's, uh, it's grass now, um, mm -hmm. and uh, it's uh, kind of in between the 9th and, and 18th fairway there. And um, oftentimes, so for instance, if we have a meeting for um, 150 people, let's say, in the barn, so they have the general session meeting, and the president of the company is giving their speech, whatnot, they go through everything, and then they break for lunch, um, they can't eat in the same room that they're in, mm -hmm. and it's that is too many people to go into that small barn. So they have to eat somewhere, and the majority of time with hotels, they'll go outside and we'll have all of the rounds set up with umbrellas, and they'll sit outside. And so the lawn is is only there to serve the needs of uh, for meals for the barn. Okay. Um, are the facilities going to be leased or rented by outside um, parties like, say, Topa Topa Winery or something like that? Absolutely not. Okay. No, this is, um, this facility is directly correlated to the um, revenue needs of, of the inn itself. So leasing it out um, is, uh, doesn't do us any good. It, you know, it's, it would make no sense financially for us to ever lease the facility. Okay. Um, what's the temporary storage for? Tables and chairs. And tables, chairs, stuff. rounds, um, banquet chairs, um, any speed racks, um, audio visual also will go in there. So any screens that have to be um, put up for uh, the guests, um, just all kinds of different mm -hmm. random utility needs. With your conditional use permit that you've had for so long, do, yes. you, do you remember off the top of your head, was it conditioned for, you know, non 
hotel, no non-hotel guests, you know, not no. I don't, to be honest with you, I don't know if it ever said um, because uh, the lease was just between the Ohio Valley Inn and the owner of the ranch. Okay. Uh, so we had sole use of it. Okay. And actually our, our director of engineering lives on property mm-hmm. uh, and oversaw the whole facility. So um, we have never leased it to an outside uh a company uh, mm-hmm. and had you know people driving in and there's actually not even really that much parking for anyone to ever go down to the um, the barn the big red barn if you've been there before there's a, kind of a small parking lot so um, no uh, we would not do that okay. and we never and we haven't yeah uh, any is there an option for impervious or pervi- pervious surfaces permeable paving and things like that instead yes, uh, of 37,000 square feet I'd of impervious parking? Leave, and that'd be a good question for um, Sylvia to answer. That's, yes. um, okay. That's the goal. The can, you, can you come up to the microphone, Sylvia? Thank you. <coughs> Just let us know your name and address. Sylvia Nobili with Back and Gilliam Kruger Architects. So, yes, the driveway area is proposed as asphalt, but all the areas where cars are going to be parked is going to be impervious material, so either gravel pave or terra pave, and the entire courtyard is proposed as gravel pave, so as an impervious material. Okay. It's pervious material, sorry. Yeah. So, and all these small courtyards and gathering space, they're all gravel pave, so accessible for ADA use, but also pervious material. Okay, thank you. Those are my questions. Good. Thank you. Bobby, did you have a question? Um, I was just curious, the largest parties you have in the red barn that you use now? Um, about the same. I mean, it, dip, um, it didn't when seem we that do large to, to me. Three, I've yeah, when we do the larger parties down there, yeah. they have to be outside and inside uh, because the right. inside can only take so much, and then you have to do the back paddock and then the front as well. So um, we've had Cedar Sinai, I can remember, was nearly 500 people, and that was really busting at the seams. That was a little bit difficult for us to to fully service the way we wanted to but that was the largest I can remember okay thank you I'm sorry John I have one more sure materials and color boards we have no um, representations of what your I mean we have the artist rendering right but we don't have any colors and materials to look at is that I'm gonna ask Sylvia to come back up and answer that so we're going to use a palette that is uh, a natural color palette. So the, uh, the outside of the building is going to be wood siding, stain to blend in with the surrounds. And the roof of the buildings is going to be a corrugated metal roof to rem- remind us of the agricultural buildings that are typical of the site and also of what we want to represent with these buildings. The outside uh, is going to be gravel pave and natural. Uh, native landscaping to both being conservative with the water usage and also with the tip- with the site, and uh, so we are proposing also olive trees to be again consistent with what uh, is uh, on uh, native of uh, what is uh, around the area of OI. But yes, wood siding on the outside uh, and a corrugated metal roof for the st- for the roofs of the buildings. So we are very conscious of the site where we are and the environment, and also, like Chris was talking about, the location of the building. The bigger barn is tucked in in one of the fairways, so beyond behind one of the mounds of the golf course. So try to hide the building as much as possible, not only from the outside of the campus, but also inside of the campus. This is the lowest area of the entire campus, and inside the areas, again. and. We are also having trees planted all around the building so that also when you are in the golf course and you're looking at the site, the new developed site, it'll be screened by natural vegetation. Sounds beautiful. Were you, were you asked to provide a color or materials board? We actually provided a, a material board with some examples of the references of the images we were going to use. You mean physical pieces or? Yeah, well, or just something that. Yeah, there's you know, a, like a material board in the presentation. The commissioners the might review sheets uh, A9.00 through A923, which has renderings. I'm not sure if a chipboard was submitted, but it does have some, no, some that's photos. What I'm no. And uh, we asked, uh, and that's we were told that, that this uh, material board sheet would have been enough. So we didn't bring any physical example. 
usually you know we have the color we have the actual color we see some rendering on a piece of paper that has the, the color designated and you know you, but it's fine I I, I, I don't know if to answer your question but the ceiling the roofs sorry is going to be a, mo a bonderized so similar to zinc color so in that tones of colors and the siding is going to be redwood and is going to be stained to stain the natural tones of the redwood so there's no planning on, pla on painting the, the siding and if we don't go to a bonderized zinc roof then it still be in the darker tones of the roof uh, roofing color thank you um Ray? I'm reading on page five of seven, the outdoor event lawn will predominantly be restored lawn from the golf course. So could you tell us more about that, what the shape the lawn in is now, how that's gonna be restored, and then what additional lawn, how much additional lawn is being put on? Because predominantly is ambiguous. Well, there's some mounding up on the back side that is all grass, um, so I'm not exactly sure. I think the use of the word predominantly was probably because the exact calculations weren't, but it is a large area in between both of those fairways. So, um, and 10,000 square feet will be carved out as the actual event lawn itself. I would say, I mean, I'm no expert, I would say that that whole area is probably 20,000 square feet, uh, so the mounds will continue to exist and then it will come, you know, and the lawn itself will be carved out in the middle. So I would say that we are not, uh, we're, we're not adding more lawn space to it. Um, if anything, we are uh, subtracting both sides of the lawn um, that the facility will go into. Sorry, I, I'm trying to, to like visualize it exactly, but yeah, the lawns on both sides would be eliminated. And then um, on the far, far end of the project, that would not increase. In terms of what are you, so you have basically the same area of, you know, that's getting irrigated? Yes, it? as it is currently now. Okay, other questions? I have a question. Um, about the height of the building. Okay, so it looks to me like you are going 15 feet beyond what is um, permitted. Zoning district says 35 feet with 10 feet for other architectural elements and then five feet more on top of that this is another great question for Sylvia to come up here and, and <laughs> help me with because uh, uh, as their applicant is arising I would suggest that um, Ms. Lisa could clarify at that point a little bit um, the maximum height is 35 feet um, their original proposal I know was much more than 35 feet and we had talked about it and looked at the code and determined that they could go five feet over. So their maximum height is 40 feet. Um, that's why there are so many elevations and um, different cuts and sections. Because of the way the land is, if you look at it from one side, it looks like it's taller when it actually isn't, but that's why they did so many sections so you could see how the grade of the land affects things and it's at the maximum point is 40 feet. So they're only five feet over their maximum height. 35 feet is their maximum. The tallest point is they exceed the height limitation by five feet. So this says, okay, so, okay, you're, so you're saying that, that the exceptions are for architect, architectural features up to 10 feet, and you're saying they only go five feet? Yes. Okay. And, and that's what the are those peak of the, That's the peak of okay. the roof to give it that barn look and feel. Okay. So that's the architectural element? Right. It's kind of stretching architectural element, but okay. <laughs> it's an element that's part of the architecture. All right. Other questions? Yeah. Okay. Mr. Powers? First, I want to acknowledge that I know the, the inn has um, always been a bit ahead of the curve in terms of water conservation, water reuse, and all of that. So I'm wondering um, how that's going to be implemented into this design in terms of any gray water or rainwater harvesting off the roof and things like that. What's the vision there? Um, I wonder if Kathy Nolan, if, if you might be able to discuss that. But I do appreciate you saying that because um, uh, about... Uh, 
three years ago, we invested, the owners invested in uh, nearly a $2 million in a complete irrigation change of the golf course that saved a significant amount of water and reduced our consumption greatly. Um, and it was a very expensive state-of-the-art system, but we're able to control every single um, uh, shower head actually individually so we can conserve and uh, water the shadowed areas under trees less and then a little bit more balanced where you have full sunlight. So we do work hard uh, with that and we change all the faucets out and whatnot. But I'll ask uh, Kathy to, to speak about that if you don't mind. Kathy Nolan, landscape architect on the project. Um, so I'm just going to be addressing the water um, in the landscape, so on the exterior of the building, not any of the fixtures inside, which Chris just covered. But um, if you look on your plan, you'll notice we had some rain gardens in there initially. Since then, we've had an updated soils report, so we're going to a greater length of not only uh, filtering the water to cover stormwater requirements, but also infiltration. So we, we're actually not going to be doing those rain gardens, but we are collecting the water from the site in um, underground gravel filtration basins, so it, they'll be, the water will essentially be, be cleaned and then allowed to percolate back in. So on the ground plane, you'll see a lot of area drains and also the pervious um, gravel paved material. So the water, any extra water due to the soil type will be caught up in the drains and then go into the gravel uh, filtration basin. And, um, and then as far as planting and water use, of course we have to meet the state requirement for, for the uh, model water efficient landscape ordinance. And uh, so we'll be using water efficient irrigation and then everything we do in the landscape has to comply with our allotment that will be assigned based on the calculation of the square footage and our evapotranspiration rate in this area. So, so if I understood you, the, the rainwater let's hope we get rain, mm -hmm. that comes off the roof will go into these, these drains and then go into the um, gravel exactly. filter basins underground. Yeah. Got it. And what about interior? I know this isn't your purview, but the interior sink water, because there's restrooms, right? And things like, yeah. where's all that water going? Sewer? Or gray, wa or gray water? Uh, my understanding, it is going to sewer. <clears throat> okay. Great. Other questions? Rosalind. So just to be clear, are you saying that if you have a wedding that all the guests are staying at the hotel? Um, I would say that um, most of our weddings are destination weddings. Mm -hmm. So they're coming in from um, really all over the world, to be honest with you. And um, we, when we sell a wedding, there's... Um, the way that, that it works with selling groups and, and hotels is that um, we evaluate the room revenue, we evaluate the ancillary spend, which would mean how much you would sp spend at the spa or in some of our food and beverage outlets. We evaluate how much your banquet spend is. Um, and they all have to make, they have to go through a test to make sure that it makes sense. We call it rev, you know, revenue maximization. And so Yes, we actually, we provide, uh, if you want to get married at the inn, you have to meet a certain food and beverage menu, you have to fill so many rooms, you have to sign a contract to guarantee that, um, and, you know, those are our requirements. Um, we, we do about 38, this year we're doing 38 weddings this year, and um, all the guests want to stay at the inn. They always do want to stay at the inn. So there aren't a lot of people from Ojai people who live here going to the wedding necessarily no I can't recall having a wedding at the inn from any um, in the ballrooms of anyone that actually lived in Ojai to be honest with you most of them are um, are further out I mean as close as Los Angeles maybe Santa Barbara we've had a couple but usually they're like New York they're Chicago they're the Pacific Northwest uh, we've had a couple international weddings so it's definitely becoming more of a destination draw um, coming to Ojai in general for these these couples. They fall in love with it, whether or not they learned about it in the media or they saw a friend got married there or social media. Um, so um, we always require people to stay at the hotel. Great, thanks. Other questions? So would that be something that could be conditioned, that it has to be hotel? I mean, obviously, the biggest issue in my mind is the parking, is the parking and the traffic um, right. because we, we just don't have any data that indicates anything here in well, that we, regard 
we don't have enough parking as it is at the Ohio Valley. If you haven't noticed on, uh, coming in on a weekend, it's very challenging for us. So um, uh, parking is an absolute premium for us. Um, it's very difficult for us to do. I've come from hotels that are in city hotels or other destinations where they have lots of parking or um, they have more day events or social events like uh, hospital galas and things of that nature. Because of our location, we don't have much of that here in Ojai anyway. But um, as far as driving goes, it's too much pressure on our front staff, our valet people, um, and we always, we want to drive, we're in business for room revenue, to be honest with you, you know, that is your highest profit margin is when you fill rooms. Uh, food and beverage does not have a, a, as high of a profit margin, actually none of the ancillary revenues do. So our entire you know, focus is to fill the rooms as often as possible. So having day events, just coming in and driving and then leaving, um, is absolutely not a, de a desire of ours um, because there's just the um, profitability is too low and it's just operationally and logistically too hard to handle. That's one of the reasons we actually built that new motor court that you that you know of is because um, just for hotel guests alone, I mean, you can have 600 plus people, you know, two people in a room. We have 303 rooms now and it's very challenging with that old mortar court. So now we feel like we're finally a little bit more comfortable with this new mortar court design. Um, but there's still, that didn't help our overall parking problem at the property. So, yeah. but so it sounds like, um, there won't be a lot of traffic on city streets or outside the facility. Right. That's people. I come mean, there we, and they, when I, when I was mentioning, um, you know, the, the benefits I and mean, we, I know our neighbors on Country Club Road are going to be very happy, and all of them on, on uh, really all surrounding our property are going to be pleased because um, there's a, a lot of activity going in and out of that uh, of the resort from the back uh, loading dock exit and the front, and so this really reduces a tremendous amount of traffic uh, within the Ojai within that that quadrant essentially from Creek Hermosa Ojai Avenue, and then uh, Country Club Road. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? Anything? Thank you. I do have two speakers cards, so I want to get to uh, the public. Let's see. So I have a card here from Sarah Otterstrom. Um, thank you for having me here tonight. I'd like to express um, my concerns about this project. Um, in the last two years, if this project goes forward, the inn will have lost 7% of its open space, which is a significant amount without having um, greater um, discussion and public review. Um, the project um, will impact nine um, native oaks and um, we'll, be we'll be adding an additional 64 non-native olives to the landscaping. And um, in view of the recent actions by the inn to take out legacy trees, um, more than a dozen of them without permits, um, to me, I question why we would be rewarding the inn by allowing them to plant more non-native trees and take out native trees. Um, the architecture is Spanish col colonial, and it's, um, this is a historical landmark, and we're putting in a California vernacular barn. Um, the CEQA exemption that's uh, requested is incorrect. There is um, several hundred feet from this site. Um, there are recent documentation of red-legged frogs, and there's um, and I have um, access to copies of, of research and reports that show that. So to say that something's in a golf course doesn't mean that there, it's exempt from CEQA, especially when you're several hundred feet from um, endangered species. Um, probably as a resident of Country Club Road and living 1,800 feet from this new barn, my biggest concern are the noise and traffic effects. Um, knowing that the inns um, was shut down by the county and their operation on Creek Road was shut down because of the noise impacts there. Um, and knowing that um, there um, we already are being impacted by noise on Country Club Road from other um, activities in the area. Um, we think it's on the, the burden is on Ovis to prove and to demonstrate what the actual noise will be. It's not enough just to say there will be noise, no noise impacts. Um, 
Finally, um, the same thing with the, the, the question of traffic, to make the, the assumption or to, to argue that there will be no increased um, activity at the inn as a result of this because it's parallel, it's the same thing as what was on Creek Road is inaccurate. Even um, the presenter stated they were going to add cooking classes and they're going to be offering a new amenity at the inn. And so to just accept there will be no additional traffic and no, no additional activity or intensification activity I think is inaccurate and finally I'd like to say as a neighbor to the inn I think that the inn um, in the last five years that we've lived there we've seen a lot of activity and ongoing and last December when we met with Alex Kim we were told there are no additional plans and we don't have any plans well five months later I find out there's another big project and plan and I think the inn owes it to the city and to the neighbors and the residents to give us a five-year ten-year vision for the inn and all the projects that they have underway instead of telling the neighbors there are no plans and there's nothing going on because we know that's untrue and I mean we, we see that all the time so that's what those are some of my concerns and the concerns of my family that is also part of the of the of the county and attend schools in the valley and are part of the city of Ojai thanks thank you Ms. Hunterstern and I have a card from Don Dini. <coughs> Good evening, Don Teeting. Um, Julie Tumamayat Stensley, who is the tribal chair of the Barbarino Venturino Band of Mission Indians, which is our local uh, band here, is not able to attend tonight, so I will be making some points on her behalf. Um, as you're aware, the local Native American tribes are recognized experts in tribal cultural resources. They have knowledge of area, the area and specific expertise. Um, they know of resources that exist in the areas which may not be recorded in the archaeological record. The tribe has reviewed the archaeological report, um, which is confidential, so I realize that you have not received it, but they do recommend that uh, the areas where there will be earth disturbing activities be subject to um, what's called subsurface testing, which you are, are familiar with as an extended phase one. Uh, to make sure that no resources may be encountered. Um, so that you will see what I passed out before you is a copy of the proposed conditions of, of approval that are on the project currently with red line through um, striking some of them. So the first, the um, first condition is to add subsurface testing for the area. It states conduct an extended phase one subsurface testing by a qualified archaeologist prior to any other earth disturbing activity. A Native American Chumash miner must be present during testing and in the event that resources are encountered, procedures for encountering cultural resources shall be followed. The other recommendations are to strike uh, conditions of approval three through six because they are redundant with numbers 20 and 21. They contain unclear language, they do not follow standard archaeological procedures, and they are actually inaccurate. Number five references Section 106. Section 106 applies to federally funded projects, which I assume this is not a federally pro funded project. So there's a lot of confusion in these first three through six conditions of approval. It appears that boilerplate language was used as well as in the archaeological report which cites federal and state regulations that do not apply to this project. Um, therefore, instead of, uh, we recommend striking three through six and changing number 21 to include the simple statement, it's basically um, the city's standard language that we have for monitoring of all earth disturbances by an archaeologist and a Chumash representative. That's essentially what three through six say uh, in a much simpler way. And we also recommend, as, as always, changing preservation on site to preservation in place, which is the state recommendation. That's in number 21. And adding the city's standard language um, to require contracts for both an archaeologist and a Chumash monitor, and that's stated in the red line in number two, 22. So thank you for your consideration. 
Thank you, Don. Anyone else would like to speak on this? Okay, I'm going to close the public hearing. Um, certainly. I, I just wanted to um, be clear as to um, sounds like maybe a, a neighbor of the property as far as noise impact goes. Um, first of all, um, it is inaccurate that we were being shut down because of noise uh, at, on any level. So I'm not sure exactly what that was referencing. Um, the fact that Alex Kim, I'm not Alex Kim, um, uh, he could not be here tonight, uh, relayed that there were no plans um, some time ago uh, may be true. Uh, as, as I said earlier, we uh, found out early last fall that we were not able to continue using uh, the Big Red Barn, and, and we went into um, an instant reaction mode of how are we going to fix this, where we need to have this venue. It is way too important to the Ohio Valley and to the revenue of the hotel. $6 million is a significant amount of money for the hotel. And so we had to go to the ownership. We had to explain where we're at, what was happening, that we had attorneys involved to try to see if we could extend the conditional use permit. That was not a possibility. And so we did go into the mode of we need to build a barn. This is the most attractive element for events at the Ohio Valley Inn. And so we did deploy into this, and here we are now presenting uh, the barn that we defensively need to, to build. Um, and, and just general and noise impact, um, if you can imagine, I'm trying to think of how noise impact, noise impact, impact could uh, increase for any neighbor. I mean, right now you're going to have uh, no more of the buses going down Creek Road, going down Ohio uh, Country Club. So there's no more of that exhaust, no more of the vehicles up and down um, nearly every weekend. Um, that is eliminated. They're not coming up the corridor anymore uh, from the 33, from Exec Limo, who's one of our main vendors. They're not coming up and down and up and down uh, servicing guests for these this event uh, area. Um, where it is topography, where it's located, is tucked into this these two fairways right into this area that um, kind of gives it its own um, environment and the exterior of the areas where events would be, where music could be on, for instance, plays out towards the golf course, towards the 220 acres the other way that, that we own. So um, I really, uh, I understand the, the thought of proving to us, I'm not sure how else you could prove uh, that this will uh, greatly reduce noise, but um, uh, we strongly feel it will reduce noise and this is uh, and we're also considering our own guest rooms too so uh, we need to make sure that we don't impact uh, any other guests so if, if there's only a 50 person wedding happening in the barn um, and I have another 250 rooms occupied where other people that you know don't necessarily you know have any interest in the noise of a barn happening or a wedding happening we have to make sure that they're happy too because it's just going to hurt us as well uh, when guests do complain we generally end up rebating monies and we end up discounting and if certainly that's not something we want to get into the business of all the time so all of these all of these considerations were taken what are the hours of operation chris um, for the events es essentially well we we abide by the noise uh, ordinance um, and then um, the earliest for a breakfast is generally set up at seven most meetings start at eight they're usually continental breakfast or breakfast buffets so it's noise uh is shut Anything down Anything it would be like um, dinner music. Mm -hmm. Till 10? Is that what it Til is? Till 10, right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if we could hear from uh, Kathy Nolan about the trees, the question about the non-native trees that are being installed and so on. And sure. Yeah, we are installing some uh, olives, which are native to the Mediterranean and Middle East area. But we're also installing uh, natives um, an assortment of other trees. So um, it's not, I mean, there are olives, but there are other trees too. So in the barn area and then also in our um, ancillary parking areas. What, which native trees? What native trees? Mm. Um, we're actually, there are some existing sick, uh, sequoias that are um, in the golf course that unfortunately we're gonna have to take out but we've arranged with a local um, craftsman woodworker to take those trees. They're going to get repurposed, in con and we're going to—we have a program set up with a local school. They're going to be doing some woodcraft work. So I feel good about. They're going to get repurposed. Of course, they're not protected, unfortunately, anymore in our tree ordinance. Um, so that's a native tree, but also um, uh, coast live oak, 
valley oak I'm looking at, and possibly even the native sycamores. We do, because we're, this project is nestled in the existing golf course, there's a lot of irrigation that's going to remain and that's there. And uh, trees like the sycamore and the uh, sequoia will do really well with that, that water that's going to be there. So, <clears throat> Thank you. I, I have a question for Kathy, yeah. too. The, the uh, oak at the 18th hole, the oak at the 18th hole that's being taken out, is that interfering? It, is it interfering or is there some, I mean, because I've never seen that language that somehow a tree can be taken out because it's interfering. So there actually, there are four oaks that are not shown on your plan. They're actually on the, the west side of our project. Our project is flanked by the, um, the 18th fairway on the west side. And on the, the farthest west side, there are these four oaks going down, uh, down the grade. And because we're putting the project up there, they're going to have to adjust the golf course. And if you looked at the report, um, one of them is rated, one of them is dead. So that tree is coming out. Two other of them are rated D. Those two will be coming out as far as like hazardous and having issues. Then there is a um, fourth one, tree number three, Coast Live Oak, that is rated B. And that tree is coming out. It's grouped tightly with those other trees. And the tree will get repurposed and used um, by the woodworker, local craftsman. So that is the only tree. All the other oaks um, on the project, there are two large valley oaks um, in the barn area. They're all going to be protected. And then there's also an area where we're going to be doing trenching. Um, you probably saw that in the tree report. There, all the trees will be protected. Um, there's not going to be any damage done to those trees. So it, it, there is just the one tree. So that's a bummer. Um, but what's also a bummer is that, and I don't know if I'm speaking to you on the wrong side of this table, but um, there's no none of the conditions of approval tie back to these. Um, there are no conditions of approval that tie back to the protection of the remaining trees and how things are going to be specifically worked on this project. They look like boilerplate language around trees, and it seemed like there were, from my reading of that tree report, it seemed like there were several suggestions of things that have to happen. Um, was that your understanding of, of there's certain suggestions that are called out for the protection of the remaining trees right. or in, in? Yeah, and there's actually two reports. I believe they're both in the packet. Um, the first report had to do with the four trees that are on the west side of the 18th fairway. The second report includes two existing valley oaks where the barn project is. And um, as you go towards the parking, the ancillary parking area, there's some native oaks in there. And they're included there. And all the tree protection is included. So we're not taking any of those trees out. Um, although, pardon me, there is one tree that was rated hazardous. But um, all the other ones will have the normal tree protection signage and fencing um, during construction. But you would expect to see that in the conditions, yes? Um, I, I think it would just probably in the conditions if you wanted to add something, it would be something more to um, abide by um, ISA tree protection standards. That's all in there, but I, yeah. I'm just concerned specifically about But okay. I'll talk to them about that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, right. Could someone who knows more about CEQA address the frog, red frog comment that was made? Happy to. I'm not familiar with the document that the person cited but did not provide to the city. However, the Ohio Valley Indian Spa was a subject of a comprehensive EIR some years ago, and that EIR would have included a biological analysis and study, and that EIR did not find any evidence of red-legged frog habitat on the project site. The red-legged frog hab habitat conclusion in that EIR is presumptively still valid today as there's no evidence that there are red-legged frogs that has been presented on the present side of the 18th and 9th fairways and the parking lot. But we're happy to review further evidence from, from uh, any specific evidence. Okay. Other questions? Anything? Well, good. Well, I think we're ready to well, start that, debating this. Is <laughs> that something we want to address? If, whether red-legged frogs are currently present or I don't want to just ignore it if there's possibility or newer documentation. If the 
commission is concerned to it, you could always ask the applicant to provide a biological report, but mere allegations alone don't rise to the level of evidence that would require further, further investigation. Of course. I think minimally we would have need to, which is one of the reasons I wanted to see that EIR from 2002. That would have given us the opportunity to review a lot of the statements that have been made tonight, um, but we don't have that document. So this is why I'm thinking we should continue this and get more information for various reasons. But um, I have a couple more things for staff. If sure. we're, okay. Um, in the conditions of approval, or in the resolution, excuse me, Okay, the first paragraph is talking about the motor court project. And it is also referenced on paragraph C on the following page. <laughs> I see what you mean. The very on that first, first one? The, the very first whereas uh, I know I changed that so it's just something that when it was saved for some reason that reverted back I don't know why um, and then on the second one that is just something because I know I wrote the beginning part of that so that's something that obviously when I deleted it didn't get caught in the full highlight and delete of that area um, okay but those are things that we could so correct that would need to be corrected okay um, and then what about conditions of approval for the tree, hours of operation? Um, did you, the, there's just no conditions on this project. We're happy to propose a couple of conditions that might speak to some of the concerns. Um, the first would be to require a, the, as a new um, condition below condition 12, that uh, all work on the project shall comply with the tree protection plan in the arborist report dated June 21st, 2017, which would, rather than just simply cut and pasting it, com require compliance by reference. Um, and then to speak to the other concerns, it kind of gets to traffic, parking, noise, and um, related uh, tourism impact concerns, add a new condition, perhaps a new um, one after the after number one the new assembly event venue facility shall be operated as an event venue for events organized by hotel guests and now be to be clear this one doesn't prohibit an attendee of an event from not staying at the, at the inn in recognition that that may not be where the commission wished to go but it would require that the events be organized by hotel guests so given their economic realities the expectation is that that language would result in, a, in events being um, run, uh, attended by individuals who are almost all, if not all, staying at the inn and thus the attendant reductions in traffic that would come from that would be built in between the combination of the language and the market. If the commission wanted to go further, you can go further. Um, happy to discuss further. Thank you. Did you have any others to add? We're, of, of course, happy to craft anything else you'd like us to craft. Well, I mean, the cultural resources issue is a whole other thing. Um, so there's obviously language in there that's not pertinent to this particular project, and that then just brings into, you know, this is a lot for us to, to try, you know, for, uh, you know, we, I don't think we can go through this and s decide what is and isn't valid and what, what, whether or not it works for the applicant. Um, so I'm not sure what to do with all this, too. We're happy to offer a suggestion for that, which would be leave it set and not make these changes. The reason being that the, the language in there that's, that's in the resolution now is a combination of the city's current standard conditions and the language recommended by the archaeologists who prepared the archaeological report as summarized in the staff report. Um, again, of course, the commission has the power to change any of this if you wish, but that staff's recommendation is... Uh, the concern noted about the reference to the federal standard can be resolved by striking, either striking that sentence and the rest remains, or else leaving that sentence in in recognition of the fact that the sentence there, which refers to data recovery, is not required by law, but is the most commonly agreed upon measure under projects that fall under that federal uh, statute, 
is the basis for which the for the imposition of the data recovery condition. So you're not requiring it provides a basis for it, and that's why the archaeologist put it together. Would have been cleaner to separate out conditions and reasons for conditions into two different places, but here we are. Um, the commission, of course, can change that. On the other, on the edits to the standard conditions, um, the difference between what's pro looking at condition 21 on the back of the sheet from Ms. Teeting, the archaeologist recommended in condition number three that the initial excavation be monitored by a qualified archaeologist and a Native American monitor. The recommendation from Ms. Teeting is that all earth disturbances be monitored by a city approved archaeologist and a Chumash representative. Um, th that's a choice for the commission. The archaeologist recommended monitoring of initial excavation and not further monitoring. The um, uh, commission has that choice. Staff would recommend that the commission impose the requirements recommended by the archaeologist, but the choice is yours. And um, the executed contracts, there's no issue with that, adding that condition. Um, and that is, I believe, part of our updated standard conditions. I think there's a couple of versions of the standard conditions floating around. So, at, so can you summarize then what, what you're saying you would include? Yeah, so this? staff's recommendation thus to summarize would be leave STET conditions two, three, four, five, and six. Leave in place. The ones that are here. The ones that are there now. Okay. And then um, for conditions 20, one and 22, which are also there now and are reproduced on the sheet handed out to you tonight. Mm -hmm. Leave condition 21 as is, but add the proposed new condition 22, which reads, prior to the issuance of a grading permit or building permit, the applicant shall submit to the city executed contracts for both the archaeologist and the Chumash monitor. There's no issue with that condition. That's our um, proposal, or recommendation rather, not proposal, recommendation. Of course, if you wish to change any of that, I'll help you craft it as you'd like. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Other discussion? Bobby? Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to say I think it's a very nice project. I think a lot of attention has gone into it. I appreciate that you tucked it into that kind of private spot at the, at the inn where it is. Um, I've delivered a lot of cakes to the barn. I know that it's a pretty important part of your venue. Um, the project's gigantic, but uh, nicely done. Thank you. Any other discussion? Anybody want to make a motion? Rosalie, you want to try for continuance? Yeah, that's what I'd like to do. I'd like to make a motion to continue um, this item until we can get the, the information, um, more information, including um, the previous permits, um, the, um, the, the 2002 EIR. Um, I'd like these, what, what Chris sort of explained, the answers to the questions that I asked, I'd like those incorporated in a report, and then I'd like to see a traffic study that really sort of takes into account this information and sort of creates a baseline for how if the whole report is hanging on that we basically are losing this and gaining this and therefore there's no impact but we have no knowledge other than you know the, these statements that it, this is how it was so we I don't know how we make a decision with no data so it would be great if we could get some kind of data that gives us a better feel for um, this idea that um, there isn't going to be more traffic, uh, you know, an overwhelming amount of traffic, and the idea that you know guests are. I, I just when if at a 500 person function, I just I can't imagine there's going to be all those people are not all going to be staying at the end. I think there's going to be a lot of people coming, driving in, and um, if that's wrong, then I'd just like to see some some information that helps me get there because right now I just I don't have anything that says that other than the statement that. That's how it is. So that's not how we roll here, in my opinion. We should not. But um, it's nothing. I think the project is um, very attractive and all that other stuff. And um, I think, yes, um, this is a, a Spanish colonial building. But I mean, development, and it is a historic development. But 
I think that again we've we've been here every single time with the inn and we we talk about how we have to allow it to be a living breathing thing that adapts over time and um, you know that, that sometimes you know when the Department of Interior will say we don't want to just create another faux structure we want to create other things that highlight that Spanish colonial heritage so uh, that that works for me the materials the colors all that works for me um, it's huge it's a bit scary all that lawn scary um, but again it was a golf course so um, again I just want to see some facts some supportable facts Thank so you. I'm making motion to continue the item until uh, date certain date certain all right is there a second I'll second that I, I appreciate Commissioner Zabilla's um, due diligence on data and I'm big on data I love the project I agree it's huge um, but I get the needs that it's servicing um, but it's good to have all the data so we, we have it even if we end up approving it at least it's on record and we we have it could we have a roll call on that please Isabella yes Corbin um, no I don't see how you can do a traffic report that's not sort of a guess I don't really think you can factually prove that every single guest is going to either stay there or not stay there. In my experience with events that have happened at the inns, most of the guests do stay there. Merck? No. Powers? Yes. Okay, now we're stuck. We got a tie vote. <laughs> I vote, nothing happens. <laughs> so. Okay, nothing happens. So what does that mean? Try again with a new motion. All right. I Red? I could be swayed, but I, I want to hear what the data would look like, Rosalie. Well, that's so you my question is how would I prove? So, I mean, what would be provided? Well, a traffic study is a thing. It's not a letter from a company that, you know, says, <laughs> they said there's not going to be, you know, this or that, and therefore. You know, that's what, the that's what your traffic report says, with all due respect. It says, you told us this, and based on that, it's not going to be different. But that's not what a traffic study is. A traffic study makes certain assumptions, and, you know, I... I, I well, cur currently, are there weddings that are similar size to what are going to happen at the new barn? Come on over there, yeah. That'd be great. Thank you. Sorry, could you ask that one more time? So currently, mm -hmm. are there weddings similar to size that are going to happen at the new venue? W once it's built, do you mean? Yeah, that once it's built. Yes. So currently at the end, though, when you're using the big red barn, mm -hmm. those are similar sized weddings that you're expecting at the new venue or smaller? S no, similar size. Similar size. So we're We only have so many rooms at the hotel, we can't, you know. Okay have more people than what I mean there there are times I should I mean um, Ms. Zavilla that um, just economically driven where somebody won't maybe not be able or choose not to pay the room rate of the inn and they may stay at a local hotel um, I don't know how I would be able to prove how what percentage that would be or whatnot but when we give um, when we send a contract out for a wedding we say you have to fill you know, this many rooms, 180 rooms, 200 rooms, whatever the case is, and they have to, then they fill them. Um, and usually uh, we, we have no, we have no issues with that at all because all the people are coming in from all over. They're flying into Santa Barbara or LA, some Burbank. Okay. See, so, so what I'm wondering is, is I can see the need for data. However, if it's kind of the same number of annual weddings booked with the same number of people and they're going to be kept on site versus going to the big red barn then it's sort of apples and apples I, don't even see where there's a, I mean we're going to be eliminating all these shuttle bus trips well and that's I don't the, see where there's a I'm not sure how to, to prove it otherwise to say is that we we no longer lease the facility so there would be no reason Ever for us to drive there again therefore traffic is reduced there would never be another shuttle bus going down there um, it's no longer ours um, 
I, I can, um, I guess I could pull uh, data on, on the 6,700 room nights that we sell annually and show and provide I don't. I don't know. Contracts of it's saying Big Red Barn and how many people and what food and beverage minimum is. But we certainly we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be using it for 26 years if we weren't having so many events down there and it wasn't so important to us. If you guys got a conditional use permit that would have had conditions on it, it would have exp it would have been very clear how many people. You know that would have been a baseline. That's it's a simple thing. The conditional use permit should have outlined all that, and then we would say, okay, that was. That is what you were operating on before. We can operate off that that information now. You guys are welcome to make another motion. Okay, I mean, feel we're free. But I, I, you know, I can't. I, I just no, can't. I understand your. I completely understand where you're coming from. Um, Twenty six years ago, when um, how old was I? Um, I it was uh, actually no one that works at the hotel that has any knowledge of the initial lease and how this all came about um, was is still there uh, when we first started leasing um, Rancho Dos Rios. So there was a little bit of uh, grayness there when this all came to light for us because we were surprised ourselves to understand that the land use wasn't the uh, appropriate us to the way that we were using it for events. So it was a surprise to us. Um, but once you know, once reality set in, there was really no uh, no choice but for us to go into action and to figure out how we're going to keep this business going. Um, other than my word and, and telling you, and I know you don't know me, but are seeing the buses and seeing the activity and knowing and going online and seeing all the activity that happens at that barn, uh, it's a busy facility. It's very busy, and I can tell you, our owners wouldn't be investing eighteen million dollars in building this facility if we didn't need it to sustain the business that we have now. I, there's, they're very smart business people and they would not spend that kind of money. So if we're going to lose six million dollars a year, uh, potentially uh, at least six million, then you know this is, we need to move quickly, get it in place. So we, um, we already are uh, structuring our budget for next year that we will be taking a loss in revenue uh, for 2018 because if all goes as, as planned, it should be opening um, hopefully next fall, but we don't know with construction delays, and hopefully we get a lot of rain in January, and we're looking at a 2019 opening, um, but uh, so we're already budgeting expecting that loss. And the only last thing that I, I thought it would be good to say is that <laughs> as a res responsibility that I have at a hotel, people often, my mother still doesn't know what I do at my hotel, um, as being a sales and marketing um, leader, is I find I feel that I am responsible for the employment of the 740, 750 people that are at the hotel, because if I'm if my team and I aren't looking out two, three years and making sure we have the right baseline of group business that we can count on and budget on, and we can assume that we're going to make our revenue every single year, people lose jobs, we go backwards, and and there's a whole domino effect when you don't have room revenue. So. This project is very important, not only to uh, us, we were put in this position where we have to, to do something. Uh, it's impo important for the employment of our staff. And uh, this, isn't, this was not a desire from our owners to say, let's just build a barn. Let's just spend $18 million and build a barn. We're doing it because we have to sustain the business. And we're already looking at a really tough year for next year by not having it. And we're hoping we're going to rebound right back in 2019 uh, because people are going to start booking weddings soon. You know, they're usually that one year out, so we can hopefully start selling them on what it will look like. Uh, but it's um, so that's what keeps me up at night, um, besides my kids, is uh, making sure that we have enough business two, three years out. And this facility is very, very much tied into and directly related to the success and the sustainability of the business at the end. Great. Thank you. Would someone like to, yeah, Bobby? Uh, I'd like to make a motion that we approve design review permit DRP 1707 and tree permit T17-20 for construction of a new assembly event venue, parking lot, the removal of and work under protected trees at the Ojai Valley Inn and Spa, located at 905 Country Club Road. The conditions. Are we going to have extra conditions in there? Um, yeah, can you help me out with that? <laughs> I think Mr. Summers <laughs> had a whole list of... I can suggest the ones we suggested earlier, and, and you can um, accept or reject it in your motion. So we had suggested that on um, attachment A, page 3 of 9, 
that a new condition be added as a right after condition number one, so we'll call that new number two, um, to read the new assembly event venue facility shall be operated as an event venue for events organized by hotel guests. And then on the next page, um, bear with me a moment, on uh, page four of nine of attachment A, a new condition under 12, so we'll call that a new, new 13, um, all work on the project shall comply with the tree protection plan in the Arborist Report dated June 21st, 2017, on file with the city. And on page, oh, where'd it go? Five of, pardon me, not five, six of attachment A, a new condition uh, following condition 22 that would read, prior to the issuance of a grading permit or building permit, the applicant shall submit to the city executed contracts for both the archaeologist and the Chumash monitor. Great. And that's the, oh, and then the last one would be the um, correction of the reference to the motor court in, um, yes. <laughs> throughout. Basically strike paragraph one and rewrite it. I have a question. All right, right. Does the condition of hours of operation go in here that Commissioner Zabilla mentioned, or is that a separate could have, That could be added as thing. a condition. The commission has the power to add to such a condition thing. if you wish. Well, I'm going to leave, leave that point. to Commissioner Zabilla because I can't remember all the conditions except for that one. Are, is there anything you want to add? <laughs> No, I'm not. A, I'm not a part of this motion, but I will say that you know he, Chris was saying that they're, they just follow the local ordinance. Yeah, there is a ordinance that prevents anything after ten o'clock. So, that's your motion. Yes. All right. Is there a second for this motion? Ray, I think it's up to you. I'll second that. All right. Any discussion? Could we have a roll call, please? Isabella. No. Corbin? Yes. Merck? Yes. Powers? Yes. Motion okay. passes. Thank you all for all your diligence. And um, we look forward to seeing this online really quickly. Yeah. <laughs> all right, we are going to move on to uh, item number two. This is a conceptual view review, CR 1704, for a proposed change of use to a beer tasting room alcoholic beverages sales on site as well as a small kitchen serving the customers of the tasting at 345 East Ojai Avenue. Assessor's parcel number is 02301230. The general plan designation of the site is general commercial and the zoning classification of the site is commercial. Property owner is the Ojai Valley Cleaners. The applicant is Jack Dyer of Topa Topa Brewing Company. And could we hear from staff on this please? Uh, tonight before you, as you stated, is a concept review for a proposed uh, beer tasting room. Um, the concept is in preliminary phase so that comments and concerns can be addressed in the early stages. Staff has provided the regulations that apply to a C1 project. This project, as designed, should be evaluated and comments to the applicant should address the feasibility for the use on the site and its ability to comply with development standards. Based on the information provided to staff, the minimum application requirement would be a design review permit and potentially a variance, um, and that would be for the covered patio area outside that they're proposing. Um, as part of the processing of design review permit, environmental review will be conducted and also um, provide an opportunity for interagency review, such as Ventura County's Flood Control, Ventura County Fire Department, Caltrans, um, Ventura County Air Pollution Control, etc. cetera. Um, I know there had been uh, an email sent to you with um, concerns about the business itself being more tourism based and the laundry, um, the cleaning, the cleaners going away. The cleaners are not going away. They're just getting rid of the facility that actually does all the cleaning. So they'll ship the clothes out, they'll get cleaned and then brought back into the storefront. So the storefront will still be there. So the cleaners will still be in operation. They just won't be actually doing the cleaning on site with the chemicals and things like that. Um, other than that, I'm going to leave this to the applicant to answer any further questions on this project. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for staff before we I have a quick question. Um, Catherine, I know this isn't your project, um, <laughs> so it's okay. Don't panic. Um, <laughs> but 
Um, is the variance, do you know if the variance is limited to the pat, what is, what is the variance? It said, in, in here it said something like patio cover, et cetera. So I don't, I mean, I only know what I read in the report along with you, okay. like this okay. wasn't my project, but from what I was looking at it and the building already being there and then working within the confines of that building, I do believe that the variance would only be for the covered patio portion coming out into that setback area. Okay. And do we know, and maybe this is a Mr. Summers question, does um, the, the possibility of alcohol require that pony wall? Yeah, if you have alcohol served in an outside space, ABC, as part of their licensure, requires that you have a wall of um, two or three feet tall that blocks off the full area in which you're serving alcohol. Three feet tall, thank you. Three feet. Three feet tall, minimum height wall in any area in which you're serving alcohol uh, to prevent the, for obvious reasons, prevent it from being passed off to people who aren't part of the operation. And, and, do and we if I remember sorry. Sorry, correctly as well, they also require that that wall not have an, an unguarded entry. You can't just let people walk into the patio, so little, it has to, no gates. If you have a gate, it has to be host stand right there. Um. That was my other question. Um, do we know if, um, shoot, it just flew out my brain. <laughs> While Rosalie's It'll thinking, come back. I just wanted to clarify for the public, do we have any control over what kind of businesses go into which buildings in town? No, the, uh, unless the city wishes to facilitate businesses going into locations such as the RDA, have, did under its powers, most of which no longer exist? Short answer, no. Thank we you. can encourage, we can um, facilitate, we can zone. I should back up, I should, uh, of course, clarify. City has the power to prohibit certain businesses from being in an area. The city has a zoning power and can prohibit anything it wishes to prohibit within certain bounds set by state law, but within what is permitted in a given area, the city can't force only this and not that. Ooh. Thank you. I thought of my thing. Good. Can I say it before I forget again? Do we know if any of this, is this all on private property or is the outdoor seating in the public right away? I believe that point remains to be clarified with an exact uh, analysis of the proposal. Okay, thank you. It does look on the plans like the property line goes around the mm -hmm. seating, but I don't know. Yeah. I assume that's the, the sidewalk out there, but we'll ask the applicant. And yet so, the applicant would probably hit. Yeah. He'll know that one better than I. So can we hear from the applicant on this? I think oh, Mr. Powers sorry, had, a question. had a question. Piggybacking yeah, on uh, what the chair asked, um, is the city or the commission, is it in our purview to limit the number of businesses that are of the same kind? So what you said, we, we you know, the city could say, oh, not a whole kind of business, but can the city or commission say, hey, you know, we have, we have enough of those. With the right factual basis and with an amendment to the zoning ordinance approved after full consideration by this commission and approved by the council, yes, the city has the power to impose concentration limits. You often see this with adult-based businesses uh, where cities will prohibit them within the next distance of each other or with so many in a given area. So yes, the city does have the power to, speaking generally, limit the number of certain types of a business. The trick in making sure that those are defensible is to ensure that there's a solid record of impacts as a result of the business. So in the adult-based business example, there's a uh, fair amount of detailed available evidence that adult-based adult -based businesses result in a certain amount of additional crime and secondary impacts that derive not from the protected character of their expression, but derive from the uh, general uh, operation of those businesses and the, those secondary effects create the basis on which a city can defensively limit the number. The same kind of record would have to be developed if the city was going to consider limiting uh, concentrations of a particular kind of business. And of course, the classic example in Ojai is the formula retail ordinance. The city has prohibited certain types of formula retail businesses subject to a variety of rules in recognition of the negative impacts that derive from the aesthetic impacts caused by a, a visual field of nothing but um, formula retail signs. I, I realize that's a general answer, but I, it sounds like you had a general question. Thank you. 
other questions for Sam? Okay, can we hear from the applicant? Good evening, commissioners. Uh, my name is Josh Griffin, project manager at Cornerstone Architects, and I'm representative for the, uh, the owner, the business, Topa Topa Brewing Company. Um, I'll address a couple of the questions that came up because I am familiar with the staff report, having spoke with uh, Jay Higgins, who authored it. Um, f first off, I mean, you're aware of the business. This, this is a, a craft brewer. Um, I want to point out, and, and the owner is in, in the audience, and he can speak more to the business side of it, but up front I want to point out this is a, a locally owned small business, craft business. They have two existing retail outlets right now. This would be their third. Um, so by no means is it a formula business. Um, it makes sense to have, since it's a locally owned business, to have one in Ojai. Um, this is being called a tap room or a tasting room. I want to stay away from the word like bar or drinking establishment. It, it's the, equivalent, the beer equivalent of a wine tasting venue. So it's pretty similar to what Ojai has a number of, um, you know, we're not like Los Libos yet or some, or that's all we have, but, uh, um, but I want to point out this, this business is, is a, a family, family friendly business. And, and again, the owner will speak more to that. Um, architecturally, um, I think everybody in Ojai is familiar with this, pro this property. Uh, we drive by it every day. A lot of us probably, um, much to our own chagrin, use it as a parking spot. It's a very dangerous corner to park at. People dropping off and uh, picking up, you know, they're cleaning or getting a quick coffee. Um, it's a very dangerous place to park. Uh, part of, you know, this, this change that we're proposing it would, would eliminate that as parking and, and just make it more aesthetically pleasing to that downtown corner. Um, to, to that end, uh, the proposal includes an outdoor seating area. Um, just to touch on one of the questions that was asked, the property line is in line with the front, um, along the sidewalk, so in line with the front of the rest of the buildings along that frontage. So the face of Ojai Coffee Roasting, that's the property line continues along there. So about 15 foot back from that is all part of their property. That whole parking area is part of the property except for the sidewalk. So we would not be extending over into the public right of way at all. We'd all be on our own property. Um, we're proposing that the three foot site wall along that perimeter uh, for ABC and also just to kind of enclose that little area uh, as an outdoor seating area. We are proposing a, a covered, a portion of it to be a covered area. We want to leave some of it open, nice weather, people can enjoy the sun if it's not too hot. Um, but you know, there'll be some shaded areas in there as well. Um, the existing windows that you're all familiar with, the big win glass windows that there at the cleaners uh, would be replaced with glass sectional doors that could actually open all the way up which would open up the seating area to the inside and give it a more open feel. Um, in addition, we'd have on Montgomery Street on the side, we would have a, uh, there's an existing smaller windows that were replaced with a, a sectional window that could open up. And so that would open up that part to that street. Um, not so you could walk in and out there, there'd be a, a bar along that window um, that people could sit at. And you see this in Santa Barbara and other communities where they have, where it opens up to the street. Um, everything we're doing, and I, I believe I included a, a picture in uh, our narrative of the building when it was originally built in 1920s. It was an automobile uh, service station. And uh, we're trying to tie into that history a little bit with our design. Um, and unfortunately, when it was originally built, the, the pull through service station portion of it was right on the corner. In fact, it was in, partially in the street. Obviously, we can't do that, so we, we wanted to move it back to the, uh, the corner adjacent to the coffee roasting. Um, but still kind of tie into that <laughs> nature, the his historic aspects of the building. And then using the, the sectional windows that would roll up as doors, that kind of uh, reflects again the, the automobile service station um, aspect of the original property. Um, the, the, uh, the new shade structure would be very similar to the, uh, the historic with the plastered columns. Um, for shade, it would be uh, some kind of a shade cloth. Um, some steel beams, giving that kind of garage feel to it still. Um, most of the original building will, you know, the plastered walls, the, the detail on the top of the front wall, the facade, that would all remain um, as is. You know, we'd probably clean it up, paint it, uh, and do that type of thing. Um, in terms of landscape, there's very little on the site for landscape. So uh, what we're proposing is against the, the coffee roasting wall is some, uh, some sort of a green wall that would you know, give some landscape to that seating area and also cool down that area under the covered parking. And then we'd have, a, you know, some miniature planters along the site wall to buffer it from the sidewalk as best we can. Uh, in terms of traffic, um, we will we'll be getting a traffic study before the design review, obviously. Um, 
but in, in talking with a traffic engineer, similar uses between the cleaners and, and our use um, is, is in existence as a baseline. Um, in addition, we're hoping with this project to encourage uh, less vehicular traffic and, and more uh, pedestrian and, and, and potentially bicycle uh, traffic. Um, and, and one of our proposals or recommendations is we'd like to work uh, with, with staff and with uh, Public Works in developing some sort of a bicycle storage area in that corner, um, possibly doing what they do in other jurisdictions and, and having taken one of those parking spots right along that corner. Um, that's kind of in a blind corner anyway, and, and converting that into a bicycle storage, which not only serves this business, but you know the whole downtown area. Uh, so that's something we'd like to, to discuss further. Um, and, and because of the additional uh, parking demands, we, we were hoping that we could mitigate some of those parking, additional parking demands with a, a bicycle parking rack, which would be more, um, you know, more desirable, I think, in Ojai. Um, so I think that pretty much addressed everything. I, I can answer any questions architecturally or design. If you want to know more about the business, uh, Jack Dyer, one of the, the co-founders, is here and can speak to that as well. Great. Does anybody have questions? Uh, just a quick question, Josh. Um, did you say okay? Sorry. Yeah, go. Okay. Um, I'm I'm just looking at the um, artist rendering. Are you are you saying that I see what look like static windows and then a door? Are you where's the roll up? So, sectional door. So all three of those larger windows, the two in the front facing Ojai Avenue and the one on the side, would are sectional or, or some kind of a roll up. We have to figure out um, structurally how that would work with it inside the building. But they would all open up fully and open up to the. So the two on Ojai Avenue facing the seating area are actually doors that go down to grade. Uh -huh. So those would open up so you can walk through them. The one on Montgomery, um, you can see it's slightly higher, you know, 12 inches, 18 inches higher. And then there'd be a bar across it, which you can kind of see in the rendering. Which, so you wouldn't walk through that window. You'd have no. to go through the front door. But you're saying they'd roll up like a garage door yeah. and be completely yeah. open air. Completely open, yeah. Okay. Obviously, on a nice day in Ojai, you'd want to be able to open those up and have everything feel like you're outdoor. Okay, Commissioner Nolan. <clears throat> this is a, a minor little detail to consider. There's something um, spatially interesting about the way the site presently is recessed on that corner. It's kind of invites you, um, and ch it's a kind of a, a break in the wall on the, the existing buildings on Ojai Avenue there. And I noticed that you did this on the Montgomery edge, and this is where your low three-foot wall, perimeter wall, attaches to the existing building. There's a slight recess, and I find that to be a really nice little detail, and I'm wondering if you could consider that on the Ojai Avenue connection. Yeah, I believe it is the... the because of the um, hierarchy of the pilasters and the wall mm -hmm. columns, um, the pilaster for the covered storage is actually recessed from the corner of well, the... Oh, maybe it doesn't look like yeah, it you can Yeah, it's probably hard to tell on Okay, a, and I looked a, on the plan and um, it looked like it didn't, yeah. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. yeah you can kind of see it's a couple inches. If you look at the east elevation on sheet A5, mm -hmm. you may just be able to see there's a few inches of recess of the new stucco column beyond mm -hmm. it's recessed a few inches off that as architects we never like to line those things up anyway because you can never match them exactly and it looks wrong so yeah so i don't know it's, i know it's a minor detail but um i think it's just you know a little yeah but then the site wall would be flush with the pilaster just because they're the same width oh but the whole thing would be recessed back from the corner of the okay. adjacent building mm -hmm. great thank great. you other questions thank you um this is a public hearing and i have two speakers cards on this uh, the first one is from Barent Bodolf. Sorry if I mispronounced your name. Well, it looks like a game show <laughs> with the lights. Um, we own the building. I'm executor to a trust that's owned that building in two generations. The one that has, I'm the only one probably here that actually shares their wall. They're talking about that's theirs. It's not separate. It's a joined wall with the coffee roasting. We have Julia Rose, and then we have Ojai Pizza. And we've worked really hard through the years. Ojai Pizza has become an instrumental in the valley, providing with the kids. They hire people out of Nordoff, everything. This business proposed the first time that I've seen that here we are presented with real competition. And I don't want to lose my tenants, and I don't want drunk people going around anymore. They don't know, but that whole area, we have trouble with transients on the back. I found them living on the 
roof from the wine tasting, they get drunk and pass out from the place behind. And there is absolutely no parking. And we can't even park at our own building. The delivery people can't. And then the people that built the wine tasting, they infringe the city, hasn't done anything to keep that easement through the back available. They keep putting trees and things, so now the delivery trucks have trouble. The cleaners are going to move back there. They're going to have to have their entrance changed. So now what's going to happen with that? So there's no parking. And the main thing is that I think it's good for the community. Ojai has had this wonderful thing through the years about no chain and franchise and this sort of family-oriented businesses. And we are coming to a point now, a precipice of this whole thing, where I fully believe in pure competition, but at the same time, I don't think we need any more alcohol in this town. The kids and families are moving. And the people, the pizza, they're people. All my kids here are the owners. It's in a multi-generational trust. I have them here learning about committee and how everything works. But I really think we need to look at this and really think because there's a face behind that's going to be affected. The pizza people, they have families. They bought homes here in town. It's a hard struggle, especially with this new Golden State, more than double your tax rate, 30-year fee on our thing that's not a tax. People are feeling it. And we want to keep those families and the kids here. And the people that come into town need to enjoy the town, have a family place with a pizza. And I'm all for what everybody's choices for businesses, but I really don't think if you don't put a McDonald's by an Ojai Frosty, we don't put in a place that serves food next to coffee roasting that's struggling and with Ojai Pizza. And I think that it really need to put some faces behind this and understand it's really dramatically going to affect not just me because I can't, I'm not selling it. I'm, it's the, these are the owners, my kids here. And what we decide here is going to affect their generation and I want them to enjoy Ojai. Anyways, I just want to, I rarely come to these, but I need to speak up. It's my job as executor to protect their interest. And if I don't do this, we could lose that interest because the place will go under because we can't afford all the new taxes with Golden State either. So anyways, I just hope the planning, I appreciate everything everybody's doing. Take that into consideration because I think if you've been here for 20 years, a business and great people, we ought to keep them, not lose them. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate all your people coming. <laughs> hope you're enjoying it. It's pretty boring. Uh, the other speaker's card is from Joe Wells. Hello. I'm basically going to say the same thing Baron said. I, uh, I feel that there's no downtown parking already. And I think with a business like this, it's, there's going to be no parking for the existing businesses that are already there. There's going to be a lot more traffic than the cleaner traffic. Um, that, that's my main concern. Uh, along with what Baron said, there is a lot of businesses that have been doing business. I own a business locally here, and um, it's, it is tough, and it seems like Ojai is changing a lot. And I think to have a same exact type of business, they're proposing to do beer and uh, pizza right next to Ojai Pizza. I think that's, along with what you guys were talking about, being the same type of businesses. Um, the parking is huge. The delivery parking, I know their easement is uh, really tough. Um, and having more, more beer next to the skate park and uh, the school. So those are my concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Uh, this is a public hearing. Is anybody else? Yes, sir. No, I need to fill out a card. No, come on up. Just uh, give us your name and address. And my address? Okay. Michael Haley. Uh, what is my address? 1577 Kennewa Street. Um, at, I, I presume you all saw my email, so I won't re re reiterate all that. Um, based on the discussion, though, I have to say that, you know, I just moved down here from Napa about a year and a half ago. I was a grape grower up there, very involved in local politics there for a long time. Um, I put specifically that some of the code from St. Helena, the city of St. Helena, you can, you can, uh, regulate what business goes in what place, but you have to do it up front. You know, you can't decide tonight, you know, no more brew pubs in Ojai yourselves. But if you put it into the city code, and if it's in the general plan, you can do that. Obviously, other cities have done it. St. Helena's done it. Calistoga does it. Calistoga, which is another city, small town in uh, Napa County, 
um, they have a rule that whatever business goes out, you have to have the same business come in, you know? They've had problems with that. It's so restrictive. It's, uh, it's unbelievably restrictive, but it's legal. So if you had a dry cleaners, the only thing a new owner could do is put a new dry cleaners in, according to their uh, city ordinances and their general plan. There is a process for appealing all that, and so the city council could have discretion to turn it over. I know that you guys can't do that here tonight. Uh, my point is that we need to do something because we're losing our community. You know, to me, Ojai is a, like a glass of water that's full. And if you pour in more tourist serving businesses, something else is gonna have to pour out, and that's locals. And we're gradually putting too much into tourism and we're losing our local community, you know, and it's affected housing quite a bit already. It's gonna start to affect other things if we go any further with it. So one of the things that is in the general plan is a paying attention to cumulative impacts. And I think the cumulative impacts, it's not this one brewery or brew pub that's the problem, it's the prolif pro proliferation of so many of them. And so we gotta start thinking about how we can deal with that. Um, and you know, it's not about just this one business, although that, that's very important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does anybody else wants to speak on this? Do you want to? I would like to, if you don't mind. Uh, first off, thank you, uh, staff, for the can administrative you, Can report. you give us your name? Oh, I'm sorry, Jack Dyer. Um, I'm the, one of the co-founders of Topa Topa uh, Brewing Company. Um, so yeah, I wanted to thank staff for the comments. We thoroughly read through the report and um, we appreciated some of the comments that in our attempt, we really tried to uh, incorporate this design into the aesthetic that we know and love here, here in Ojai. Um, to speak to a couple of things that I'd love you guys to, to know is that um, we are an Ojai owned business. Um, it, I don't know how many of you were familiar, but we did try and do the entire um, Topa Topa project here in town. Uh, we're named after the Topa Topa Mountains uh, that we can see from my backyard uh, here, in, here in downtown, as well as my co-founder Kyle uh, and his wife Kate with their two sons. They, they all live, we all live here in Ojai. Uh, a good portion of our staff lives here in Ojai too. They just currently make the drive down to Ventura um, to, to, to do their job. So when this um, project presented itself to us uh, as an opportunity, we've been working with the owners of the uh, dry cleaners buildings for honestly a couple of years now and talking about this as a potential landing spot for an additional tap room um, for Topa Topa Brewing Company. Um, so it was a great opportunity for us to, to bring our our brand to the center of town for which our brand is named. Um, so that's really how we look at this as, as, as a tap room um, branding concept. The uh, food element that we're including in, in this um, project is different than some of the other projects that we've done, say in the Santa Barbara or even our Ventura tap room, if any of you have been there. Um, and we did that solely to, to hopefully add, add a very unique and cool element to serve the community. Um, we're not really as focused on a tourism-based business. We kind of have that arm of our business already entrenched in Santa Barbara in the funk zone where we make, we touch and service a lot of people. Um, the fact is we sell, we sell a lot of beer in, in Ojai right now, as it is, at the uh, accounts around. So we recognize it as an opportunity to uh, further cement our brand and um, keep some of those uh, profits in-house in, in, in here. Instead of selling them to an account, we can sell it over our own counter. Um, which was always our, our design uh, of, our, of our company. So those are a couple of things. If any of you have been to any of our tap rooms, they're very family and community focused. Um, we are a 1% for the planet company. So we do a lot of fundraising uh, events where we host community uh, nonprofits where we help and we give a portion of our sales to those, to those um, things. That desire and that um, brand identity was born here in Ojai. And um, that's something that we do. Uh, we're very active in, in the community in that, in that sense. I myself serve on the board of the Ojai Valley Defense Fund um, proudly. Uh, we support all the Ojai Valley Land Conservancy's uh, events in any way, shape, or form we can, usually with, uh, with beer to help the, them, them get people ready to make, write larger checks than we're able to. Um, so we, we're very, very active here. Again, we employ a lot of people here. Uh, this tap room in itself uh, will be staffed with people from the valley. And um, that's something that uh, 
as business owner, uh, a couple years in, we're only two years old. Uh, it's absolutely the number one thing that I'm most proud of is that we've been able to create a number of jobs uh, in a, a number of communities and, and employ uh, some really bright, talented people. To, to, and certainly here in Ohio, that'll, that'll be no different. Um, we have had some success, and then uh, Josh alluded to it with some public-private partnerships that we'd love to talk to you guys about, in particular uh, increasing foot and bike traffic uh, to the event, certainly uh, to, uh, to, to the tap room. Certainly, we, incur we, don't, we don't encourage people to drive to visit our, our location. Uh, if you've been to our Ventura location, we have a total of eight parking spaces. Uh, they fill up about 10 minutes after we open, and, they're, and people still seem to find us. So um, I like to work with cities and, and, and communities in creative ways to solve those problems to get less people driving to us and more people biking and walking. We just did that in our Santa Barbara location where we worked with the city to install a, um, a, a full parking space worth of of bike racks. Um, we have some pictures and stuff of that that we'd love to share with you guys at the right time to, to talk about that because that was a super successful thing that um, that the city and, and Topa Topa worked on. Um, one of the things we've also done is tried to focus on areas where we can take something um, old and turn it into something new, maybe breathe some new life into the building. Uh, the fact that the dry cleaners are staying there was something that was kind of critical to this deal and, and making it coalesce and come together. Uh, the gals there were very concerned about their customers and they wanted to make sure that they were still able to provide that service to the valley and we agreed I get my dry cleaning done there so um, it's uh, but this building itself I think we have a really unique opportunity to, to breathe some some new life into a, an otherwise um, uh, qu quieter corner or um, sometimes dangerous corner uh, when people are driving in there and, and using it as parking. Um, so that, that was really something very cool. We did it down in Ventura with a really old printing press building, turned that into our primary brewing facility. Um, and then we've done it in, uh, in uh, Santa Barbara as well in a collaborative project to turn an old warehouse space uh, into something a little more vibrant, create more tax revenue for, for the town. Um, so that's a big part of what we like to do. Uh, to address something earlier from the, some of the ABC guidelines, we're happy to provide those. We're very familiar with them as far as like the setbacks and, and what's required. They don't actually don't actually require a gate. Uh, they just require it to be a certain um, width uh, so, so people can't just kind of freely walk in and out. But we have all that uh, down from our, our, our other two tap rooms and um, we're ready, ready, ready and willing to work with you guys. We think Josh and the guys came up with a great design that uh, captures the, the essence of, of who we are and, and more importantly uh, who the town is here in Ojai. So um, we're excited to get to work and, and if, if I can address anything for any of you at any point, feel free to reach out because we're, we're ready and willing to, to get this project going. So Great. thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions for Mr. Dyer? Yeah. Mr. Dyer, I have a question. Um, are, are you brewing on site or no? No, um, that was one of the, um, I'm, I apologize, I missed that in my notes. Um, no, with our, we, we have no plans for to, to brew on site here. Uh, this isn't zoned as manufacturing, so that would present right. a, a big problem in getting it rezoned. Um, but furthermore, um, you know, it's one of those hindsight uh, Monday, Monday, Monday morning quarterbacks. Initially, our plan was to do uh, this whole project next to the skate park there and a fairly decent sized development that never got legs and never got going. And now that I actually run a brewery, I see um, all that traffic on Ojai Avenue probably wouldn't be good with 18 wheelers drill delivering grain and us pulling kegs in and out. So, no, there would be no production here. Um, with our Type 23 license as a small beer manufacturer, we're able to have up to six tap rooms um, outside satellite systems similar winery license. So all production will remain off-site, and then we'll be doing probably once a week deliveries. Uh, we don't anticipate Ojai to be our busiest location that, that we have, and, and we manage Santa Barbara right now, which is actually quite busy with one delivery a week um, uh, for, for our, our needs as, as a tap room. So I don't anticipate too, too much of that, but um, yeah, that, 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 that's how we're handling our production. That's all going to be off-site. How do you respond to the comments that you've heard tonight about the concerns about, you know, so many alcohol-based businesses here um, in such a small area. I, I counted myself about 20 between the Topa Winery and this location. Um, and then um, also the concern about, um, we live in a capitalist society, but the concern about selling pizza next to an established pizza business. Well, the pizza actually isn't part of our project, and they're doing um, a, a couple of different things with, with their menu. I, I'm not, I don't own the, the per person who's coming in as that part of the project. They're actually a separate, separate tenant that we're going to be subleasing to. Um, so, uh, but I do know that um, 
the products and services that the two uh, businesses offer are, are quite different um, and probably different price points. Uh, and, um, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, a, I'm a fan of, uh, of OI Pizza. I've been in there a bunch of times uh, before. They don't currently serve our beer, so I'd love to give an opportunity for folks who might want to enjoy pizza and our beer together to be able to do that. Um, so there's, there's that element. But, you know, there's, there's a pizza place in Miner's Oaks. Uh, good friends with them. There's one in uh, out at the East End, which is a place that we love to go as as well. So I don't think America's appetite for pizza is um, is, is waning anytime soon. Um, but I would say that we offer a very different experience, um, and and that's probably the most important thing. While on the surface it might look like just pizza and beer, people come to Topa Topa to engage with our staff and learn about the beers that we make. And we are very much a tasting room environment. Um, we train all our staff in uh, both surf safe, um, serve safe uh, certification, and as well as they're all um, certified beer servers. So they are very knowledgeable about the product that they're doing. So it's much more akin to a winery tasting room experience. We don't have TVs, we don't have video games and that type of thing. Our focus is beer. Um, we like to say that we take that very seriously and not much else, um, but that's a big part of what we do. So I think it differentiates itself quite quite enough. Um, I, don't, I don't think I'm, uh, I don't think it would have been the smartest move to come in and, and do the same thing next to a 26-year-old business. Um, I think we're offering a different, um, a different piece of the puzzle that, that certain clients are going to look for or on different days of the week, they're going to be looking for different things. Um, so that, that's how I would address some of that. And then just also reiterate that, that we live here too. Um, you know, we, that's, that's a big, big part of who we are. And again, we, we might not, I might not have been here for 20 years, but I've been here for, for a little while and uh, this is home. Our roots are here and we're not going anywhere, so. I have one more question. Okay, sure. Um, is Topa, Topa Topa Brewing going to become a formula business? Do you have plans for big expansion so that we end up with a chain right in the middle of downtown? No, actually, legally, legally with our um, with our with our license, we're limited to six tap rooms, um, and they that count where we where we actually brew. So we wouldn't technically qualify for that. Um, and for us right now, we're we're actually maxing out our capacity as is. So as we add tap rooms um, to to our, our our business model and and open those up, we're, we pull back a little distribution um, that we. We do so it's uh we there's only so much beer we can make physically in our in our um area so no we we, we don't have the ability legally with our license to, to become a formula business yeah. okay. um isn't our chain ordinance three businesses uh, mr summers can probably i believe it's 10 but i was ten. just looking to confirm i believe it's 10 is the trigger yeah. thank you it's scored on the staffing board the trigger for the city's formula retail ordinance is 10 of the same, plus a variety of other requirements. So okay. if you've got six or less, then you haven't hit 10 yet. Yeah, and, and right now this will be our third. So we've talked about it um, many times is that in our business plan, even when we first started, this was kind of the triangle of, of tap rooms. Um, for, from a purely beer making and business standpoint, there's a lot of craft breweries opening right now, um, about two every every week, I believe, across the country. Mm. And this new kind of tap room model is something um, that's very attractive. It makes sense. You kind of eliminate the middleman, um, and you can legally here in California sell um, via your tap rooms at the highest profit margin. So it, it makes us a, a fairly healthy business for our landlords and for our customers. Uh, for our customers and, and more importantly for our, our team. We employ 37 people now. Um, and so, you know, that's, again, to, I guess, take a little bit off of what the, the guys from the inside, that, that's what keeps me up at night, worrying about them and how we're gonna uh, keep this business going for them. And, and a tap room, a healthy tap room is a really uh, good way to do that. Yeah. Great. Um, go ahead, Bob. So mm -hmm. the pizza is a sublease from you, is that correct? Yeah, so we worked it out with the with the owners. She didn't necessarily want to get into, you know, she wanted us to take one whole lease, but we didn't need the entire space. Um, so we tried to figure out a creative way to eat up some of the right. square footage that we don't necessarily need um, because our tap rooms don't take too, too much to operate. We really need a cold box, a small bar, and then some convenient seating areas for, for people. Um, so we didn't need the entire space so that we, we carved out a little sublease for a food element, which we felt um, added value to the project and added value to the downtown corridor. I, I have um, mixed feelings 
about the idea of how many of the same businesses operate in a very small town. And while there are nuances of difference that may exist, you know, the reality of it is that even though everybody thinks we have 900,000 tourists, we only do like maybe one or two days a week. Mm -hmm. And so my, my hesitation is in fact, having another pizza place kind of right next door to the one that's been there. And I, I do feel that that's problematic in reality for, uh, for small businesses in a tiny town. Thank you. Mr. Powers, you have questions? Well, first, I, d I just want to acknowledge your success and your enthusiasm about your product. Um, I wasn't aware you're, you were brewing in Ventura, so I'm happy to hear that. Um, I don't think, you know, given the drought in California and how much water it takes to brew beer, uh, I'm glad you're not in Ohio. You don't have to, my wife manages water supply in the region, so you don't have to remind me about that. She reminds me every day. <laughs> um, Commissioner Isabella asked you, you know, after, and, and mentioned she counted, you know, 20 alcohol-based businesses between Topa and, and, and this location. And, and she asked you how you felt about that. So I'm hearing you speak about your business and your commitment to your business, but I would like to hear how you feel about that. Because um, what Commissioner Corbin just said, beyond pizza, is, you know, we have the vine across the street, we have the hub, we have all these establishments, there's a new approval, we uh, design approval, concept approval across the street next door to Bonnie Lou's that's going in. So beyond your, your uh, desire to sell us on your concept and business, I want to know how you feel about adding another establishment that's contributing to the alcohol culture that we're already immersed deeply in in this small strip of real estate here. I wouldn't necessarily categorize us in the same category as the hub or um, the vine. I feel like we offer a much different experience, more akin to the wine tasting rooms that I personally believe that um, a high tide rises all boats in that in that area. So if, if we can create uh, an environment where um, people are, are visiting uh, a couple of wineries and visiting us, it's going to make Ojai more of a um, uh, a fun destination for for those tourists and and also we've become and each and every one of our tap rooms the two of them that we have now we've become way more of a local spot than we had ever um, envisioned so I don't necessarily think it's a, a problem as much um, having multiple establishments I think it gives people options and creates competition to make everyone better and I think that ultimately in the long run is going to improve the town um, our aesthetic and our design is very much to embed ourselves in the community, um, become involved in, in, involved in that fashion and create a space wherein the community can come and, and join with us and, and share in our product. Um, so I think, we, I think by offering a different experience, it doesn't concern me as, as much um, as, 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 you know, I go to the Vine all the time and I usually go there for live music or something like that. So I think we offer a little bit of a different uh, experience than, than that. And, and and what is your response to Mr. Haley's comments regarding um, establishing a business that's tourism based? Um, when you know, there's a big conversation in t <laughs> within Ojai now about tourism, traffic, the number of businesses that service the tourism uh, industry, um, the need for businesses that serve more of a local local needs, uh, real needs that aren't here, et cetera, like that. I just <coughs> want to hear a response yeah, on I, that. I, I, again, I don't, I don't believe our business, there's not enough tourists coming to Ojai to justify doing a tap room solely for that purpose. Um, so right now we do sell a great deal of our beer uh, in the local markets, uh, which it, it's, it's 
proportionally higher. Um, and I think that has to do with our, the fact that one, we live here. Um, so we know a lot of people, a lot of people know us, they're familiar with us. And then, um, two, um, I think people assimilate the local name. Um, it might not be made right here in Ojai, uh, which hindsight being 2020 is, is, is probably a, uh, a good thing, but there's a very hyper local movement. Um, and I think people want to come, uh, to a place just like they may go to, uh, a bakery and pick up their, their bread for the weekend. They want to go to a place where they can pick up their beer uh, for the weekend. And that's part of what we're, our, our, our location will, will provide them right here in the center of town. And, and where else is your beer available other than Papa Lennon's? Where is it on tap? What businesses have it here in oh, you town? Test me now. Um, the Deer Lodge serves our beer. Papa Lennon's serves our beer. Um, Bacali serves our beer. Um, probably a couple other places the inn and spa serves our beer okay. um, so there's a handful of a handful of places we hope to keep all those relationships going because again there they're only able to taste one of our products we typically have 12 to 15 beers offered uh in a tasting environment um so people can come and get little samples of each one again talk to talk to some of the beer makers talk to some of the owners and that's the type of culture that's um, really been booming around the country right now and um, there's a bunch of articles that i'd be happy to share with you guys recently about kind of these types of establishments reinventing main streets and and um you know really bolstering business uh, because the you know people who who come through town or even locals they may come to us to pick up a growler to go but then they may end up in one of the other shops and or restaurants uh there there downtown and we don't sell too much of our beer on the shelf at like a a Vons or anything like that so some of that is it will drive people to that downtown corridor which which we think is a good thing um you know if they're visiting us for that and then going next door for a bite to eat that that's fine with us we're, we're not a food focused business our, our job is to is to make quality beer and sell that so. mr no one has a question yeah i have a couple comments and questions sure. um yes it's another alcohol establishment but i almost look at it um and tourists will come but you know oftentimes um, and as you mentioned, it, it could be and can be a local hangout, which I think is good. I like the interface of having the outdoor area and the roll-up windows and interfacing on the street. Um, potentially, that could even slow down traffic, which is really important in that area. Um, I know traffic is an issue, so we, you know, at some point we'd probably want to see a traffic study. I know that there's adjacent, within 500 feet, public parking lots. I'm also very interested in your um, concept, which um, for the bike storage area, uh, I happen to chair the Complete Streets Committee through the Planning Commission, and we've discussed something very similar for some other locations, and only in discussion at this point, but in Ojai. Um, so I, um, I do promote the biking, and I think the outdoor seating and that the whole architectural design will promote more walkability. Um, I think my my really big concern is when I first, you know, I got the pack and I looked and I go, why are they putting another pizza place there? Not that I don't like pizza and I and pizza and beer is a, is a good combination, but it gets back to that us being a small town um, and the Ojai Pizza, which is very well established, being just right there. And I don't know how locked in, you know, if there's an, you know, what your agreement is with this person who's doing the uh, the, the pizza kitchen. Or if there's an opportunity for it to be something else, I'm, I'm just kind of throwing out that as a consideration. It's it's duly noted. I'm just yeah. um, I'd have to look into like <clears throat> what the jurisdictions of the city are at that point because I'm not. Again, I believe they offer a very different product and experience. And there's uh, no, no one from that business here tonight. No. Okay. Well, and on that point, it is bear in mind the city under the existing zoning doesn't presently have a regulation that would prohibit two pizza places adjacent right. to each other. Right. It's the comments from Mr. Haley about other city zoning are noted, as I noted earlier in response right. to the question from Commissioner Powers, the city has the power to adopt uh, concentration requirements right. or otherwise amend the zoning code, but that doesn't exist right now. So, no, And I'm fully aware of that. It was really more for them to consider it. Oh, of course. Yeah, that, and that's, that's fine. That's, I mean, yeah, I mean yeah. otherwise, you know, I like pizza. You know, I don't have anything <laughs> against pizza. And I, I like gluten-free pizza, you know. <laughs> I, I would say from their, from their perspective, um, they're also Ojai locals. They understand. They all grew up here. Um, the founders of that business, uh, good, good friends of ours. 
Um, they have somewhat of a rabid following on the uh, on the catering scene, I guess. Um, but they they also have flexibility to do a lot of different things. Um, and this space is going to provide them that, um, you know, they do a variety of salads and that sort of thing that, uh, again, to us, this isn't a food focused project. Our project is beer tasting and getting that room, whoever occupies that back space is someone is whoever's going to be successful in that space. If it happens to be Cespi salads, maybe I should call them. Um, <laughs> if it happens to be them and they happen to be successful, great. But if, if that doesn't work out, we can always put another business um, in, in, in that space, considering it is a sublease. So we do have that discretion. Um, but right now, I do think there's enough differences in, in what they're offering as opposed to what other people are. Great. Other questions? Can I have your water? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay. Uh, well, do I have, have more questions. Right. I I do. Just in in terms of uh, defining more what you're saying, because I've I've heard you say several times, it's a different experience. It's a different experience. It's a different experience. So in terms of this pizza, and I know you're not the purveyor of that. You're saying they're offering a different experience. What are they offering? Uh, I. If, if you haven't had a chance to try their stuff, um, keep, keep an eye out for them at local events. But they, um, they are a wood-fired pizza, um, so it's just it's much, I guess, smaller. Um, I guess maybe more artisan-focused, um, entirely local ingredients uh, that they use. I can't speak enough to, uh, to the differences. I'm not a pizza okay. maker, so I'm not here to debate the differences. Is that do. who's been at Farmer and the Cook or over they at the farm? They started at Farmer and the Cook and, and some okay, of Okay, I know those yeah. folks. So, um, okay. Really good guys. They do a lot of work with Patagonia. Um, again, I, I don't want that to become the, the decision maker of this project because... Some definition and yeah. more intel on that. I, I just I want to reiterate, we're not out to like put anyone else out under or anything we just thought that it complemented our space quite well and they were a good partner we do work with them on a number of different um, areas and uh, we have a great work working relationship to them we vetted about three or four different providers those are the ones that came out on top right now um, that could potentially change down the road uh, that there is some flexibility there yeah. great. thank you thank you um, I think that's, I think we've got all our questions for you. Great. Thank yeah. you guys very much for the yeah. opportunity. Yeah. Um, this is still a public hearing. Does anybody else want to speak? Yeah. Come on up. Just let us know who you are. <laughs> Hi. I'm sorry to keep you longer. I'm Alexandra Barron's wife. Um, and he, as trustee and for the kids, owns the building that houses Ojai Coffee Roasting, which shares the common wall with the dry cleaners. Uh, old building and then Julia Rose and our tenant um, oh hi pizza and I just wanted to give you kind of I know you're trying to make everybody happy and you have competing interests and I just felt I could explain a little bit about our concern is that it's not so much there's a competition for oh hi pizza because it is so good but when you're gonna go to oh hi pizza and you're looking for parking you can't find parking. We have a big car, big family. The only reason we get to go there and we even choose to go there is because we own the building and we can park in the back, right, where all the delivery people go. But other people have trouble finding parking. So once you have another very popular, great brewery place with pizza, and like he said, you know, people take the only spots and park there all day at their other location, then where are all the other people going to be able to park who want to go to Ojai Pizza? They're going to end up going somewhere else. So even though their pizza is great when it comes to trying to take your family to pizza and you can't find parking anywhere because there's none it's going to hurt their business because the dry cleaner right now you pull into that little spot you get your dry cleaning you leave it only takes the one spot of their property it doesn't take any other parking spots but our tenants julia rose and oi pizza and coffee roasting are constantly complaining about parking because people from other businesses park illegally in our back lot we have an easement right behind the dry cleaners and then that's where the delivery trucks squeeze in and they're always fighting about that because they can't block the street to get their deliveries and then you have the house behind their private residence and then the pizza delivery people and everyone's fighting over parking and then there's always some cars none of them know about that are from someone else in the community that found a great place to park and they can't get their deliveries in so that's been a constant 
hassle for the people there, the three tenants we have, Ohio, Ohio Coffee Roasting, Julia Rose, and Ohio Pizza, since I married Barron. They're constantly fighting about that. So the dry cleaner is not an issue. They park right in front. But when you have another business that requires employees to park somewhere, delivery people and um, people coming to, to use the place, it's going to end up hurting all three of our tenants because they're not going to get people who need to park because they're, someone's going to park and hang out all day having a nice time in the brewery. And so that's going to hurt all of our tenants just from a logistical standpoint, not really from a competition standpoint. And um, the other point I wanted to make is that when we parked, because we own the building, to have Ojai Pizza behind the building, we came out one day with our friends and there were some drunk people in the building behind throwing dishes and smashing them everywhere and the pieces were flying and our kids were like, oh, they're breaking dishes on purpose. They were like traumatized for days. This is a while back. Um, I'm, I'm taking too much time probably. Anyway, so um, it just can affect the whole... Um, logistics of the existing tenants who have family-owned businesses, you know, kids work there, they work there for, for years, I just feel like it's going to end up hurting them. We went to um, the Ventura Surf Shop on Thompson, which is, I think, next to the other brewery or another similar brewery, and we tried to go five times to buy a wetsuit. We could not go because we could not find parking. It was impossible to get parking because it was all being taken up by the brewery people. And it took us five times to be able to go when someone left to get a wetsuit. And I'm really concerned that that's going to hurt the business of all our tenants. And I know that you know they have a right to have it. I just wish they could do it somewhere else where it wouldn't be right there that's going to hurt our, our, um, our tenants. And I realize that it's private property and you have to ju you know, juggle everyone's interests, but that's just why we were nervous when we heard about it because that's what we anticipate will probably be the impact on our tenants and us. Thank you. Thank you. I understand what you mean. I'm in a, I always park in the dry cleaner's parking lot to pick up my pizza. So. <laughs> All right, um, this is a concept review, so um, what we typically do is just go around the commission and uh, everyone can comment. Uh, Commissioner Isabella, you want to start us off? Sure. Um, so I think the use of the building, you know, remains something for everyone to come to ponder as you go forward this is just a concept review nothing's going to be decided tonight so um, but but we clearly don't have any ability to speak to use right now so um, for me the design of, of course I I love the idea of um, the take on the old garage I love the roll-up door idea um, of course Love that you're preserving that the the architectural details on the top. Um, I have a pretty significant problem with the shade structure. Um, I just find that you know, as Commissioner Nolan sort of alluded to, you know, that the recessed thing is um, just feels so um, important to that corner, and and I see that. I, I sort of see what you're saying. It's recessed a little bit, but the, the imposition of those pillars with that shade structure to me is so imposing. It's just sort of like too blocky. Uh, it, it just feels like it closes it off. And, um, you know, I get you got to have the pony wall, but I'd like to see that. I'd prefer to see that go away and leave it open. Um, and, and maybe... We could talk about umbrellas or something like that. I know people had a fit when Hi Ho had them, but you know maybe that's a better solution than than the the big chunky pillars right there. Feels like just a real no go. Um, and any, I think when you do bring it back, it'd be nice to see it as a photo simulation rather than an, an artist rendering, um, because right now it looks a little you know, which I think is just the artist rendering piece, but you sort of want to keep the, the grittiness a little bit of the existing structure. And I think maybe that could be communicated a little bit better with a photo simulation rather than the artist rendering. But um, other than that, I think um, I like the track you're on and um, look forward to seeing how it evolves. 
Thank you. Commissioner Corbin? Um, maybe I'll pick up on that a little bit. Um, and I'm wondering if perhaps even at just a different coloration in the part that's in the front could give a little bit more life to the front and then the back facade of the building and might just soften it up a little bit. Um, you know, I was disappointed when you guys didn't come to Ojai and, you know, we love your beer. Um, uh, you know, it, it's a nice project. Again, you know, there is the issue of saturating a town and I don't, I don't, I'm not quite sure where I stand on that at this point. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Allen. Um, well, tagging along with my two fellow commissioners and what I had brought up earlier, um, I do think that uh, corner and the mass with the shade structure, it's a little overpowering. Um, and I think, you know, with some design uh, solutions, you could remedy that. Um, I think yeah, it just needs to be lighter. Um, whether, you know, the columns become some sort of a, a recessed post and not integrated with that wall may be a solution too. Um, but generally, I'm, I'm, I don't have an, I'm not opposed to the project. So I think it's, it really comes down to just maybe some of the aesthetics there. And then once again, the, I had mentioned that just the consideration, even though I know we're not banning pizza, <laughs> and I like pizza, but uh, consider that. Thank you. Commissioner Powers? I agree with Commissioner Zabella regarding the blockiness of that one corner and, and um, shade structure. So I'm going to co-sign that comment. Um, in terms of the rest of it and the design, it works for me. You know, in the eight or nine months I've been on the commission, we've had some things that have come forward that have been or could have been precedent-setting reviews concept reviews and design reviews and I feel this is one of them I feel that um, um, I don't want to kill the messenger but there's a message <laughs> and and the message really is does the Commission or City Council want to look at what kinds of businesses and do we want to put limitations on what kinds of businesses um, are occurring in town. I feel pretty strongly we have enough alcohol establishments, period. I don't care what the experience is, there's enough. Um, yeah, we're not Los Olivas yet, but we're on our way. And, you know, we're in the centennial year. <laughs> We've celebrated the hundredth year of the naming of Ojai. And so the conversation is up, well, what's the next 100 years bringing, the next 50 years? And I don't, you know, I don't want to be, bring, be a broken record about that, but that's kind of been my theme. Well, what we're doing now is setting precedents and making decisions for the future. So although, yeah, sure, it looks pretty, and I applaud your success, I really don't feel it's the type of business we need downtown. So I like the concept as a concept. Do I like a concept in this concept in Ojai? Not at all. I think there's some really important conversations to be had around that. Thank you. Um, I have a number of comments. First of all, I was really excited to um, see this proposal because we had just looked at those historic photographs um, couple of meetings back on another project and um, I really appreciate you incorporating that sense of that old garage into this new proposal and I think this is a really iconic building in Ojai and I'm really glad you're keeping basically the the basic shape of the building which that's that's really important to all of us I think um, I think parking it sounds like it's going to be a huge issue um, I don't know from your standpoint, if it's really an issue, because I think you can just say, oh, you know, we have equivalent parking within 500 feet, but uh, at some point, somebody's going to have to deal with it. 
and it's going to be this commission <laughs> that has to find some way of dealing with all the parking downtown and that's it's getting to be more and more of a problem um, I, I'm I like the idea I love the idea of taking that first parking space on Montgomery Street and turning that into bike parking I think that would be fabulous that is a really um, nasty corner in terms of traffic and pedestrians and uh, it's it's a mess right now and I think um, it's adding the uh, wall in here I think is going to be okay but it, it kind of intensifies the use there so I think anything we can do to mitigate that would be fantastic um, and I just want to say I really appreciate your patience <laughs> with this whole I know you've you've tried several times to locate the Topa Topa Brewery up here and I um, I'm excited to see this coming to the point where maybe you'll actually be able to be here um, and I just wanted to um, thank all the members of the public who spoke on this I think it's uh, it's been great to get all that input. So that's our discussion. So I hope you can take that back and come back with a proposal for us. Thank you. So we're gonna move on. And thank you all for uh, joining in the discussion. So we're gonna move on to director decisions. Do we have is there such a thing as a director decision if we don't have a director? What, uh, well, we have a report provided in uh, item three of the director's decisions recently approved. All right. um, I won't go through every project, but it's available for review. Turning to item four, uh, we have a short-term rental update provided and a uh, code compliance case list as usual. Um, the note there is that there was a recent uh, large complex short-term rental case resolved with a uh, significant fine and a compliance agreement fine has been paid compliance agreement is already in process or is already uh, rather recorded against the property and the um, property owner in just the other day complied with the first information request under the agreement so that's a success um, turning then to item five future agenda items we have August 16th two projects up and then also I would expect at the August 16th meeting the Commission will want to consider topics for the joint meeting with the City Council which is coming up on September 12th Tuesday 6 p.m. the um, September 6th meeting is canceled and I'm not sure what's tracking yet for the for the 20th of October 4th meetings it may be the case that there's not something tracking for those meetings um, so that's the future meetings item. Turning to item six, liaison reports. That's my job. Correct. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> so planning commission committee reports. Uh, Commissioner Corbin just left, so I don't know what happened at the city council. Uh, Commissioner Zabella, was there a building appeals board? Well, I don't know because unfortunately I had a work conflict, but yes, I believe there was, and unfortunately I was unable to attend, so I apologize for that. Maybe it was recorded, that would be. I'm sure it probably was. Yeah. Thank you. Um, complete Streets Committee? Sure, I'll give a brief report. We met this afternoon, um, I guess due to the time of the year, we had probably our smallest attendance today because it was August, but uh, nevertheless, we persisted. And um, we uh, basically discussed um, a project that we're working on is sidewalk infill. We're identifying areas throughout town. We also have, we are a subcommittee, but there's a sub subcommittee that's um, actually looking at ADA accessibility in regards to um, sidewalk infill. So I think that's really important information that we'll be gathering. And um, our, we didn't have our staff member there today, so. Uh, we didn't have our, st you know, we normally we get a staff report, so I didn't, I don't have anything to say about that, which would have been the ATP grant and also the um, crossings with the rapid flashing beacon, um, especially at Whispering Oak. So hopefully next month I'll be able to give a little more information on that. And, um, and it, I think that generally kind of wraps it up. Great. Thank you. I'm glad to hear you guys are working on a flashing crossing at Whispering Oak, because that really needs that. Yeah. Just your power. Yeah, I was going yeah, to um, 
That should be in this yeah, list. I think it's time that we do. Yeah, we have been meeting, but you know, we've just kind of been kind of coalescing. And um, is that something that we need to notify staff every month, or can we just become like a regular um, report at all planning commission meetings? I think we can just add it. It's it's on the agenda yeah, now. Yeah, usually says no report. no report. Yeah, we can just okay, just put yes report. the no. <laughs> okay. So do you we'll have do a it. report? Well, I, I'd like to but say, you, could, yeah. Go ahead. you know, one, we have been meeting weekly, and the we is uh, Commissioner Nolan, Commissioner Jagliello, and myself as the Sustainability Committee. We've been continuing to review the uh, roadmap of sustainability and to look at what, how that needs to be updating, updated. We've been continuing to discuss the uh, SLRI, the Sustainable Living Research Initiative, and different projects that that might be able to get a, uh, applied to and talking about getting a similar presentation that was given by Ben Werner to the Planning Commission to to um, uh, give one to the City Council and uh, even fleshed out even more and um, we've been in some conversation with um, uh, Councilwoman um, Francina about that and and no date is set yet so that's where we're at with the Sustainability Committee right. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Corbin, we skipped over your city council report. Did you want to tell us anything about the city council? <laughs> okay, so uh, July 25th city council meeting had a huge agenda. A lot of it got continued. Um, and here are some of the issues that were discussed. Um, there was all sorts of talk about oil and gas projects and city council voted to appeal the conditional use permit for the Bentley oil project, which I believe is behind Persimmon Hill. Yeah, um, much to the chagrin of the representative from the oil company. Um, the ADU ordinance was read and it was passed. There was some discussion of changing the maximum size to 850 square feet, but um, it passed as written. Um, and after the meeting, I have a question for Matthew Summers about something I didn't understand in the way it's written. Um, the, there was a discussion about special events permits for residential zones for parties being held in people's houses and it was decided that for the short run it would be better if neighbors spoke to neighbor and we didn't try and legislate it and so that's um, where that was sign ordinance discussion was continued to september there was a big discussion about um, trolley fares and trolley schedule modification um, because there's something called the fare box to recovery ratio. I guess the city and county pay half and half to um, support the trolley and there's supposed to be a 20% um, return on the fares that are raised from the trolley and um, we're not there. So we talked about increasing the fare and um, cutting the schedule slightly. Um, and there, and with those adjustments, they would only get to 14% and not the 20% needed. Um, and there'd be an additional apparently $20,000 required from the general fund. So um, Randy Haney brought up the, the possibility of having sponsorships or advertising, if you want to call it that, but it doesn't necessarily have to be an ad, just um, something that could be uh, regulated but sold to businesses who wanted to um, have their name on the trolley somewhere in terms of raising money. So it was decided that that would be looked into. Um, and then that was continued as well. Um, there was a lot of conversation about the um, landmarking of the Nordoff Grammar School. And um, and that, that's such a big issue. 
especially in light of what we talked about today in terms of the kind of businesses that are coming to downtown and what we want this town to look at look like for the next hundred years and I think that that parcel really has the potential to be something that will anchor this town and bring in a whole different kind of business um, the school board's concerned that if it's landmarked at this point that it will kill the possibility of having people interested in it because the reality of it is that while we try and protect our city and we've tried to protect our state the reality of it is that to do business in this state and to get anything permitted and passed is a nightmare and wildly expensive and definitely does affect the nature of the businesses that people run so you know having little family businesses really and going to be an anachronism because it's just not possible um, the there was some uh, heated comments and and bad feelings because the school board felt that the city council acted in bad faith in terms of saying that they were interested in making a proposal for the building or the parcel and then um, I think they saw it as a stall tactic and maybe it was but I don't think it was done in bad faith I think it was just an idea to think about what the best use might be um, then the um, the school board claims that um, they weren't notified of the HPC meeting and therefore uh, it wasn't done in the correct format and so um, I think the the um, end result was the decision to send it back to HBC to make sure that the school board was properly notified and to go from there um, and the school board m reiterated that they have no wish to see the buildings demolished but they feel like landmarking just adds another level of red tape to it and you know there like there's definitely something to be said for that um, uh, there was a representative from Seafrog, which is um, a nonprofit dealing with air quality in the valley, and they were asking for $25,000 um, from the city to um, pay for the law firm that they hired. And what they do is uh, over is try and override or appeal the conditional use permits that the county is issuing, which will jeopardize the air quality in this valley. Um, what the county's trying to do on their general plan is really look at the county as a whole, not understanding or not really wanting to deal with the fact that that there are so many different environmental pockets that have different conditions from one part of the county to another and they're trying to say if you know something happens in one area it'll mitigate what's happened in another area when in fact it, it doesn't it doesn't mitigate it for the area that's getting polluted or you know having their air quality compromised or having you know traffic or whatever it is um, that that we just the way there are so many little weather pockets in these areas we have different environmental conditions and that that really must be looked at and that's what sea frogs trying to do um, and they're really trying to you know get the Ojai Valley represented so City Council decided um, that they would they would support them and I think that's it. Thank you. A lot you of very important much. issues, really. <laughs> yeah, a lot it was. Of important issues. Long meetings. I noticed we don't have any city council representative here, so I believe we are finished for the night. Thank you all.